for the um, pre for the presenters as well as uh, the committee member, they can use the raise hand function uh, uh, to ask the questions. And, and also we welcome your participation after the session as well. So if you would like to share perspectives and insights on today's guiding questions, the four, four questions that I listed before, uh, share your thoughts with the committee. You can click submit responses uh, link, which is a, there is a link on the meeting web page. And you can get to today's meeting website through a link on the main project website listed here, um, shown over here. Uh, and then there are also similar links to contribute to other previous uh, information gathering meetings uh, where we ask different sets of questions and you can uh, get to there and, and also submit uh, responses. So with that, uh, without um, uh, further ado, I think we can get started with uh, today's um, session. And I'll welcome our first speaker, Christoph Scher from UTH Zurich. Uh, Chris, please go ahead and share your screen. Okay. I hope you are able to see this uh, slide. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. With so yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and to contribute to this session. It's a, a very interesting topic and a very interesting topic from a scientific point of view, but it's also a very important topic from a societal point of view. And um, just as a motivation, I show you a few events that uh, we had experienced. I show you here the first event which ha happened in walking distance to my office. The location where this happens, there at one point in time, there was a small creek, and this creek is now in a pipe. And uh, if the runoff exceeds the capacity of the pipe, that's the kind of thing one gets. So this was just property damage, but there are other events, like there was this major flood in the R Valley la uh, two years ago in uh, Germany, which caused a terrific, terrible destruction and a large number of casualties. There are also events in the tropics uh, that hit societies that are not really equipped to, de to react to these kind of uh, uh, conditions. Now, to be begin with, I would just like to motivate that uh, looking into what high resolution climate models are able to do. I show you here an animation as a motivation. What you see here in uh, whitish color are liquid clouds. So these are water clouds, liquid water clouds. These bluish clouds are ice clouds. So they are high up in the troposphere. And the colors that you see here in those clouds, actually they represent heavy precipitation events. So it's a color scale. So this is a very high resolution uh, domain, so it has actually 340 million grid points, and so actually it has more grid points than we have pixels on the screen, so we, we might not see everything, but uh, I should try to start this. Yeah, it runs now. So you see the animation, it's actually one month in 2006, so initially maybe you should watch the squall lines over Africa. So you see the tropical thunderstorms moving from east to west, moving out into the Atlantic. You see here parts of uh, the intertropical convergence zone, and you see uh, vortices that spin up to hurricanes as the one that is active uh, right now. You see also in the southern part of the domain, uh, complex cloud patterns. Not everything is, uh, is observed, but overall, the structure and scaling of this cloud pattern is quite uh, accurate. Now you see a low pressure system in the southern hemisphere down here and here again, uh, elements of, of uh, hurricanes and tropical depression, depressions that form. Now, the, one of the really fascinating aspects of these simulations is that these models, they have never been taught anything about tropical meteorology. They really start off from the governing set of equations and what, and then intuitively generate the appropriate mesoscale structure without ever having been taught about. And I show you here, oops, 
I think, yeah, here you see actually the equations, essentially the equations that are in these systems and these are based on the conservation of mass, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum and conservation of water species. So we have a very uh, physical approach to the system. We don't rely in such simulations on artificial intelligence or, yeah. Now, of course, what I showed you here was impressive to see, but the question is really, quantitative validation, does kilometer resolution increase the credibility of the simulations? I show you a few aspects of that. Here first, I show you the results of the first ensemble of kilometer resolution climate simulations that is available over the Alpine region. It has been a, a coordinated experiments where many groups have contributed simulations. And so we have a, more than 20 10 year long simulations covered that cover this area at both at 12 and two to three kilometer resolution. What we are looking at is the intensity of hour long heavy precipitation. So we look at the 99.9 .9 all hour percentiles. And this is for the fall season. On the left hand side, you see observations. Here we have uh, the two kilometer simulations and here the 12 kilometer simulations using parameterized convection. Now you can see that actually the two to three kilometer simulations, they have a decent chance in representing the observed spatial distribution of these heavy events. So the events we are seeing are very well known in fall period when the Mediterranean is still warm and uh, at warm moist air is attracted from the Mediterranean Sea into the continent. There is a coastal structures, uh, both at the uh, Adriatic Sea over here and the Tyrrhenian Sea. You see also signals that are associated with the presence of the Alpine topography or topography in France. So in general, we can see here that the two to three kilometer simulations really can capture these events by the 12 kilometer simulations do not. This uh, one example, another, some other evidence that you see here is uh, the validation of the diurnal cycle. This is now for our own model, also from a 10 year long simulation. First showing the observations, the mean diurnal cycle as a function uh, of the UTC, which is almost local time in our spot. Here you see mean precipitation, wet hour frequency, and occurrence of heavy events also expressed in percentiles. And you can see that actually 12 kilometer simulations really has dramatic biases. It suffers from this problem that the experts among you, the diurnal, uh, the, the, the daily drizzle, so that the, almost every day the models generate a little bit of precipitation, but not with the appropriate intensity. Now, if one adds the two kilometer simulations, one can really see how much improvement is in these uh, simulations. Uh, really, one of the best improvements that I have seen in my lifetime, despite increasing the the horizontal resolution of models for 30 years or something like that. The next slide I show you that this can also be used to for sub-hourly precipitation. Previously, I showed you results for hourly precipitation. And in the study I refer to now, we actually plot here or validate uh, data based on stations in Switzerland. So each dot here is a station and what you see here on this axis is the observed percentiles in millimeter per one hour. And here the simulated percentiles for a range of different percentiles. And you can see for the stations where we have long-term hourly records, we see a fairly decent agreement. This is now for the one hour percentiles, but uh, the other panels now show the 10 year simulations, uh, uh, the, the, the validation for 30 minute accumulation and 10 minute accumulation. And you can see that even for these durations, these models generate decent output. It's not perfect, but overall they capture the really strong geographical variations that occur in these, uh, uh, in these uh, indices. There is some more potential to it very quickly only one can add diagnostics for hail 
the top panels are diagnostics for lightning, bottom panels, and this here only shows now two case studies. But in the paper, we discussed a much larger number. <clears throat> and what is plotted here is the simulation against corresponding observations. Now, the, hey, the, the lightning we validate against the Linet data set, which is based on the electromagnetic magnetic pulse of lightning. And you can see that uh, there is a reasonably or a decent correspondence between observations and simulations. You can also see this for Hales, and here the validation data is radar data. It's based, it's only possible within the area that you see. Now, how to use these models for climate projections? There are essentially three ways how one can use these models. The first one I just referred to as the conventional downscaling. All these uh, simulations, they be information from a transient GCM simulation. So this could basically be a CMIP6 simulation and the color scale shows the transition from cooler to warmer climate in this century. And in these simulations, one typically conducts at least decade long time slice experiments representing the control climate of the recent past and the future scenario climate. The second approach uses the pseudo global warming approach. In here, actually, one um, uses a reanalysis. We usually use the ERA 5 reanalysis to drive the control simulation or to control climate. And then we have a modified ERA 5 reanalysis, which represents future condition. And this uh, modified reanalysis corresponds to the reanalysis, but shifted by the GCM climate change signal. So if you express this in an equation, you could argue that the lateral boundary condition from the PGW run are the reanalysis run plus the delta, the change uh, signaled by the GCM. There is a third approach which we have started to use as well, which uh, uses bias corrected downscaling. So, in some way, it's closer to the conventional downscaling as control and scenario GCM uh, time slices are directly used to drive the high resolution model, but actually in this case, one uh, tries to correct, to bias correct the GCM fields. We find this is particularly important in the tropics where the GCM have really substantial biases. Some of you may know the double ITZ problem. And of course, if you use that information to drive a high resolution model, then our results show then also the high resolution model will have a double ITZ problem but the problem can actually be mitigated by using this bias correcting downscaling. Show you here a little bit of the results. So what you show here, what we show here is again for now different uh, return periods, the scaling for the whole of the Alpine region for the summer season, June, July, August. And so on the horizontal axis, is the inverse return period. So it's, it's basically the number of events per year. And so these are hourly events. So this goes from 1,000 hourly events to about 10 to the nine hourly events per year. So this would be the 10-year return period. And on the vertical axis, we don't show the, re the return levels, but actually we show the scaling, may, meaning on for the average, uh, we show how much the return value increases scaled by the warming. So we scale these results by, by the warming actually on the, the original warming at the 700 hectopascal level, which we think is representative for these cloud systems. And so we, what we observe actually is that the lower that there is an intensity of the events increases at all scales, uh, at, for all return, for all accumulation periods, but actually the signal is more pronounced for the heavy events. So for the heavy and rare events, we have uh, larger increases, scaled increases than for the smaller events. Interesting aspect is that actually it appears 
uh, that this is limited by the clausius clapero increase of about 6 to 7% per Kelvin. And this actually could be a very helpful result because in the past, I personally thought, who it's a very difficult task to say something about extremes because we even have a problem with mean amounts to say a good, to have a good statement about mean amounts. And uh, this diagram signals that it might actually be easier to project changes in heavy precipitation extremes than mean amounts because we have uh, this increase with the intensity of the rareness of the event limited by the clausius clapeyron scaling. Well, I should mention, this is uh, was actually Rudolf Clausius that uh, brought up some of that. And I have the pleasure to pass at this street, Clausius Street, almost every <clears throat> morning because Clausius actually spent some time at ETH. Now, uh, I have two more slides. What are some simple ideas how to adjust current estimates? And I think the first question is how to keep things simple. And uh, so I refer here to a report which has uh, some inspiration or gave me some inspiration. And it's really, this is a community, it's a very broad community that is using these kind of estimates. And if we change everything dramatically and make it very complicated, it will be very difficult to make this uh, work actually used. And so you see here what is written in this, uh, in this uh, report, to take account of climate change, historically derived rainfall rates should be multiplied by a climate change allowance, which they refer to as the CCA. And they suggest that for the design of new drain and sewer systems, a CCA of, of 1.4 should be used. That means actually a factor, the return values are multiplied by a factor 1.4. And if you look at the warming that we expect, maybe five, six centigrade, multiply it with the 6% per Kelvin, then you really end up with a, a CCA in that category. So there are some more details in the report. So there is some, uh, under some instances, one may use smaller CCAs than this 1.4 recommended above. Should maybe also show or mention that in Switzerland we don't use uh, we don't use PMPs. We use really return level as a function of return period. These are estimates for one station, Locarno Monti in southern Switzerland, and uh, you can see why we are interested in this topic. So on the left hand side you see daily precipitation amount. The blue is the best estimate. And you see that the 100, 100 and 200 year return levels, they amount to, 100, uh, to 340 and for 380 millimeter per day. So these are huge, uh, huge events. Actually, this would mean that you get three or four monthly total in one day. On the right hand side, you see the same analysis for hourly precipitation. You also see that there is an estimate which, which is actually a Bayesian estimate of the uncertainty, which also depends on the availability of the data record. It, of course, depends on the station considered. Now, you see what happens if we would allow for a climate change uh, allowance of 1.4, then actually the 10 year return levels go above this, uh, this uncertainty range, the 100 year, year return levels are staged slightly below these levels. This, there is a, we have a serious ch ch challenge in Switzerland because 15 years ago, they only used the blue curve. There was no uncertainty assessment going with it. Now they are, the community is introducing this uncertainty estimate, meaning is beefing up their estimate from the blue curve to the upper green curve. And uh, now, of course, the, we are discussing already the next race in um, return levels. Chris, uh, sorry to interrupt. You have two minutes left. Thank you. OK. OK. So that means we have some internal discussion. You also see that uh, why we generally don't use PMPs, because all the estimates we have, and we have a number of stations, maybe 50 stations that are more than 150 years old long, we see increases 
of uh, the return levels as a function of the return period. Uh, maybe these levels off at some point above, but we don't really know where this happens. Now then I'm already coming to the last slide. So there is really broad evidence that climate change implies increases in heavy precipitation events. That means that observations are losing their value as a guide to the future. In Switzerland, there are studies that show that already today we can, using the 100-year records, demonstrate that there are trends in heavy precipitation roughly consistent with the clausius clapeyron scaling during the last 100 years. I tried to highlight that kilometer resolution models, they have a better representation of moist convection and yield an improved validation for heavy short-term precipitation events. I have shown this for the diurnal cycle, spatial distribution of extremes, statistics for heavy events. I intended initially also to show you that uh, we also improve tropical circulations quite dramatically with this high resolution. I just mentioned these theoretical ideas that have some modeling support, namely that this uh, increase in uh, intensity will be limited, uh, or at least the model suggests so, is limited by the clausius clapper rate associated with uh, the increased capacity of air to, to hold water vapor. This amounts to six to 7% per degree warming. I've shown that some countries start to using a climate change allowance, factor of about 1.4. The same procedures could in principle be applied to uh, levels, to return levels of precipitation, but also to PMPs because PMP is an intensity, so you can scale it with this rate. Then last point, I didn't have time to highlight that there is a big effort, and some of uh, the, you are involved with that as well. There is a big effort to increase the resolution of global models, and likely within 10 years, we will have uh, global models that can be run climate time scales at kilometer resolution. So there is uh, something at the horizon that will help us actually to make better estimates of heavy precipitation events in a future climate. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you very much, Chris. Wonderful presentation and perfect timing. So now I would like to open up for questions. Uh, committee member, you can just uh, raise hand and I will call on you. And if I don't see any hand yet, I certainly have one question for you. <laughs> okay, let, um, I'll, I'll go ahead with my short question first. So Chris, do you think that your results about the upper limit of the clausius clapeyron could be dependent on the region or dependent on the model? Because I think there have been studies that suggest uh, there could be super clausius clapeyron um, yeah. changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. I, I haven't uh, really seen any convincing evidence. Maybe we see some of that later. I think there are some really important technical issues. One of these is that for this analysis, one needs to use all our percentiles. Mm -hmm. And some of the studies that found super adiabatic scaling, meaning faster than Clausius mm -hmm. Clapeyron, they used only wet our percentiles. And so there is some. Uh, Yes. Conflicting results from that. And from a physical point of view, we really have to go to to absolute frequency. That means one has to use all our percentiles uh, to in, in this kind of analysis. We have uh, some, I think your question about the region is uh, certainly valid. I could imagine that things change if we look at the tropical system systems, because there is a there's some likelihood that latent heat release, as it happens in these mm -hmm. uh, convective cells, may invigorate the cells. But I haven't really seen uh, much evidence for that so far, but certainly not uh, to be excluded. Important is that we have to use also temperature estimates for, for the scaling, and we always use not the surface temperature because right. depending where you are, surface temperature might not really represent the lower troposphere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Effie? Uh, hi, Chris. Uh, very nice. 
Uh, did I notice correctly that in your percentile plots that you had the model percentiles and observed the 10 minute amounts uh, consistently overestimated, the model consistently overestimated where yeah. when you went to one hour, it consistently underestimated. And yeah. Where is that? Yeah, absolutely. We don't fully understand, but it's uh, we certainly agree with your observations. I think this, uh, of course, the details of these models, it, there is a lot of tunable parameters in these models, hundreds. So <laughs> I think one could try to tune a model to be a bit better for the 10 minutes and another version to be a bit better for an hour. But I think that that would not be very convincing. So uh, I think we need to, to have a procedure where we can live with uh, some model uncertainties. And that's why also why I think that it's good to have a methodology that uses observations to estimate the return periods or return levels from current data or past data. And we use climate models to assess the changes that will happen to these data in the next uh, decades and centuries. Yeah, so thank you. I, As you say, no. it's, it's not good to tune, probably the model was tuned too much to produce extreme convection or something yeah. so thank you yeah. well the i mean this model i mean these are very expensive simulations actually some of these models i mean it's essentially the nwp version that is used here uh -huh. and no extra tuning over climatological time scales is taking place if you decide to run such a simulation tenure will take you three months will take three months on a big computer so there is very little opportunity to tune <laughs> yeah Thank you. So, so we, we uh, there is less tuning in these low resolution models, uh, high resolution models than there is in the low resolution mm -hmm. models. Yep. Okay. Thank you, um, John. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thank you for the presentation, Krista. Um, I I noticed yeah in the same plots that Effie was asking about the basically there was a the biases on the order of somewhere around thirty to fifty percent in terms of estimating the magnitudes of those the high percentiles. Do you have a feel for whether it's at all possible to uh, estimate the uh, the bias in climate change trend? Um, is, it, is it at all tied to the extent to which you can estimate the numbers themselves or is it something different? Do you have a feel for that? Well, not a very, not the one that I could attach numbers to it, let's put it this way. <laughs> it's. I mean, there are really large num a large sequence of uncertainties. We also know that the GCMs don't represent the changes in large scale circulation very well. Or certainly all GCMs do different things. So there are uncertainties in large scale circulations, which of course would also affect these kind of processes. So what we see in the present models is essentially the thermodynamic response. And but the thermodynamic response is, of course, the most important part of that response. And so there is some hope that we, we can do that, but much more work will be needed to address the question uh, that you just raised. So I think we are here at the beginning of these kind of uh, studies and much more will be needed. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, J uh, Jim. Um, Chris, very nice. I uh, wanted to get a Swiss perspective on uh, USPMP. Uh, one of our big problems is sub-daily rainfall extremes in mountainous terrain. Um, uh, some of the largest flood peaks and rainfall magnitudes, uh, short durations are extreme convection in mountainous terrain. Um, and uh, the in looking at these um, there's a paleo flood geomorphology picture that there are hot spots uh, of extreme rainfall and they kind of match uh, with our extreme rainfall events. The, the, the question is, um, um, are um, the uh, convection permitting climate models, um, are, are they able to resolve uh, these types of uh, hot spot, cold spot features of PMP magnitude rainfall and complex terrain? Yes, so I mean, I can say maybe something about the Alps. So in the Alps, we have uh, these, uh, and there was one diagram that showed it. Maybe I should show this again. The, 
which really highlights how we have a chance to see that. Uh, let me show this again, sorry for, but I think the question really asks for it. Hmm. So you should now see the slide again. And what you see here is really the observed distribution of some of these hotspots. And so these are uh, hotspots associated with the Seven Mountains and the Massive Central. These are the Alps. And you see that the Alps doesn't have a band in the south following the Alpine border, but it's really these kind of two hotspots. One is the Lago Maggiore area and the other is the Veneto area. These are well known from observations and they are reasonably well captured by these models. We can also see some other hotspots along the Adriatic coast. Well, we don't have the data there, that's one of the challenges. And we of course see the coastal uh, bands in this area here. Also interesting, actually, if you look at Corsica, you see, and Sardinia, you see heavy precipitation events to the eastern side of the island and not to the western side. So it says something about the weather situation that occurs. So just, just a quick, um, so these are 10 year, if you look at say something closer in the 100 to 1000 year rainfall, would you expect to see the same kinds of uh, capabilities? Yeah, that's, uh, well, if we go to 100 years, I think uh, we don't have a study that really enables to do that. So far, I'm not aware of it. And certainly, this is work that has to be done, finding out whether these kind of, uh, I, I think these paleo floods are often combinations of very special dynamical circulations, very moist air over the Mediterranean, so I think there is a potential because the, it's really the mechanism that is represented in these models. And so if the models have a chance to represent the circulation, plus the mechanisms that happened in the, in the case of upslope precipitation, where we have kind of atmospheric rivers running up, up across the Alps, then there is a chance to, to do that. But I, I agree, we, we don't have a proper idea. Thanks. Chris, can I can I really quickly follow up on this question? Are the are these maximum that we are seeing uh, produced mostly by cold season storms or summertime convective storms? Yeah, so we have that both. So this here we're looking at fall in this paper from Pichelli et al. There is also a diagram for summer. So we have it in summer, and in summer, mm. much of it. Uh, or part of it, let's put it this way, is heavy convection generated in over mountainous terrain, mm -hmm. which has a strong, very strong diurnal cycle. While in fall now, this is really associated with a moist, humid flow from the Mediterranean mm -hmm. towards the Alps. Usually that this happens when a cold, cold front runs over Europe and steers this moist air towards the Alps, or when we have actually mm -hmm. Lee cycle genesis form mm -hmm. formation in, uh, in the Gulf of Genoa. So it's a combination of these events. Mm -hmm. We also have some uh, heavy events to the north of the Alps that occur when a cyclone moves from the Mediterranean Sea to the north over the Alps, mm -hmm. and then steers actually air from the Mediterranean Sea in a long loop across and then towards the Alps, particularly mm -hmm. Austria and Switzerland are affected by such events. Great. So we go to our last question from Obi, and then we'll move to the next uh, speaker. Obi? Yeah, Chris, uh, thank you. A very clear presentation. I just have a simple question. I have a simple question. On your frequency curve, you went only up to about 200 year return period. I was curious if was there uh, any reason you stopped at 200 year or? Or, or there was no need to go beyond 200 or whatever. Yeah. There might have been other factors that yeah. didn't give you confidence beyond that. Yeah, good question. So I think the tradition of these curves has been, of course, observational day, uh, observations. And uh, I think going, and the uncertainty estimates, uh, as was evident, actually increases with the return period, of course, quite dramatically. I think if one does really a 
plain statistical analysis. You, it actually uses extreme value theory um, and some special treatment of uh, uncertainty estimates. If one does this kind of analysis with data of a duration of, let's say, 150 years for more than 200 years, then the engineers in Switzerland, I think they wouldn't trust us anymore. Mm -hmm. It's probably the, the main reason. So they would rather say, okay, then let's add another 20%. They would rather do it themselves than let mm -hmm. us do it, it, extrapolate into an area where we don't have data. All right, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Chris, uh, for the wonderful presentation. So now we move on okay. to uh, Kevin, and he's going to, um, yeah, he's from uh, Stony Brook and addressing uh, similar questions that we have asked him. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Great, yeah, thank you, Ruby, and, and thank you for, for letting me speak a little bit today. And, and what I actually framed my presentation around was actually kind of bridging the first two questions. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some work that I've been involved with through a variety of collaborations, both on evaluating uh, the simulation of precipitation and climate models by focusing on storm type, but also using different approaches um, to look at uh, how precipitation within these different types of storms might be changing in the future. And so the, the real motivation for some of the work uh, that, that I'm going to present on here is really going back to the fact that if you look at the most impactful disasters in the United States, um, and you look, of course, at the eastern half of the United States, a lot of these different types of events that produce uh, a lot of damage um, are often resulting in you know, too much rainfall um, over short periods of time. And, and so a perfect example of this, of course, is, is hurricanes and tropical cyclones uh, in the southeast and east coast and Gulf of Mexico. But you can see that the variety of way in which we experience extreme precipitation uh, in, the United States, in the United States comes from a, different, uh, a variety of different storm types. However, when we actually look at uh, conventional climate simulation, so let, we're gonna back up a whole order or two of magnitude from what Christoph was just showing and, and focus on um, CMIP scale models that typically have uh, grid spacings on the order of 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer, um, that uh, the realistic representation of precipitation in these operational climate models is, uh, remains a significant challenge. Um, so it depends, you know, no matter what metric you look at, whether it's going all the way out to the 99th percentile or even less extreme cases or, you know, the most extreme day uh, in, in a five year period or, uh, or uh, 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 sorry, your average RX five day or all these different types of, of metrics that the, there's a variety of skill within kind of conventional climate models. Uh, and so one of the questions we've kind of had is, uh, you know, is this coming from the fact that climate models struggle with the precipitation distributions themselves, or is it that they struggle with simulating the specific events, those circulations, those storm types that lead to the extreme precipitation that we're interested in? Um, and, and so first I'm gonna show some work uh, in which we've started to use storm typing as a way to uh, kind of evaluate uh, different approaches to, to climate simulations. Uh, and then I'm gonna finish uh, talking a little bit about how we start to use storyline approaches with climate models in order to kind of bridge this gap to look at how rainfall by a specific storm type might change um, in the future. And so uh, just I'm going to be really quick on this. So we're going to analyze a variety of climate models. And the way we're going to do this is using the, the Tempest Extremes algorithm, which is a, a publicly available uh, software package developed by um, a variety of people, but mostly Paul Ulrich. Uh, and, and what we've, we've developed a variety of methodologies, which I won't go into detail here, in which we can track individual tropical cyclones, for example, but all uh, a variety of different storm types. We can uh, determine the scale of the individual storm type. So in this case, we can determine the scale of a tropical cyclone um, using its dynamical wind field. And then we can use that dynamical um, scale of the storm to extract precipitation that's only from that specific storm type. So um, we've developed ways to do this for, for uh, hurricanes, but we also do this now for MCSs and, um, and extratropical cyclones. And conventionally, what we've done is we've realized that if you start to focus on individual 
storm types and start to look at rainfall changes that way um, that not only do in some cases models depending upon the type of model can they compare a little bit better to observations and the biases and the storm type precipitation might be less than the general biases but they can also be used for looking at changes in rainfall by storm type in the future. Um, and I just wanted to mention that that we've done this, for example, with hurricanes in the United States in which we look at, right, you, you can look at the left column, which is a frequency of the basically the hourly frequency of storms per year in a present simulation into the future. Uh, and then you can look at the rainfall that comes just from those type of storms, in this case, tropical cyclones. And then you can start to look at some of the details of the rainfall field by looking at things like, what, how much rainfall do you get per hour of impact? Because changes in the, the rainfall in the future are going to be driven not only by changes in intensity of the rain, but also by changes in the frequency of those type of events. Um, but I'm going to gloss over this because I want to jump real quick to this paper kind of opened our eyes to the fact that maybe we should start to actually uh, evaluate the climate models we use, not just by um, their mean or extreme precipitation indices, but maybe that we should start to do this by looking at the, the different storm types that produce the extreme precipitation. So I'm going to highlight uh, an example of some work that uh, I've been involved with uh, through the Department of Energy, in which we've We've used the storm typing of, uh, of different types of storms. So we're going to focus on tropical cyclones, extratropical cyclones, and mesoscale convective systems. Um, and, and the motivation for this study was in part because of, of course, not getting at the high resolutions that Christoph just talked about, but looking at new approaches to climate modeling for the coming decade um, to do century scale projections. Uh, and the question is, well, um, you know, going to a higher resolution. So again, not all the way to those uh, sub 10 kilometer resolutions, but a high resolution for climate models on the order of 25 kilometers. Does that offer an improvement in precipitation, particularly in, in storm by storm type compared to other approaches to high resolution climate modeling, which could be um, the uh, multi-scale modeling framework or as many others might uh, recognize it as the super parameterization uh, approach to climate modeling in which you embed these kind of CRMs that were just talked about from the global sense, but you embed them as uh, into the, the climate model itself. And so this was kind of our motivation, but I'm going to kind of show us a few ways in which we started to do this um, to look at ex precipitation extremes uh, within these different approaches. And so in all cases, I'm going to compare it to uh, to the low resolution, what we call a low resolution, which is a conventional climate model on the scale of 100 kilometer grid spacing. So the way in which we started to do this, and this is uh, um, the next few slides are from some work that was recently published and any day now should actually be on the, the GRL um, uh, website. Uh, but what we've done is we've we've developed the capability. Now this is for observation. So this is using the 20 years of the um, NASA Emerge data set. Uh, in which we we run a variety of of packages using Tempest Extremes, in which we're able to track. In this case, we're are, we're defining extreme precipitation as a really just a heavy precipitation of the of the 95th percentile. So we track individual 95th percentile blobs of precipitation, and then we can using the dynamical aspects of storm different storm types. Those ETCs in the middle, the tropical cyclones, and on the right, the mesoscale convective systems. We can associate specific extreme precipitation uh, contiguous regions of extreme precipitation with specific storm types. And so what this does is, of course, it it first uh, you know validates a lot of ongoing decades of work to suggest that in, you know in the United States, the a large amount of precipitation comes from extratropical cyclones, particularly in the north, um, the northeast and um, and upper Midwest, uh, and that of course in other parts of the country like the southeast, you get a lot of contribution uh, from tropical cyclones, uh, and then of course uh, during certain seasons, you get a lot of your contribution from mesoscale convective systems. So this in itself doesn't tell us anything new that we didn't already know, but what it does allow us to do is, is start to compare, okay, how well do climate models do at representing the actual pathways to extreme precipitation in, in, in reality? And so here's an example of a conventional, right? This is E3SM, but I would say it's a conventional uh, climate model that are typically used in, in CMIP. Uh, exercises. And so what you can see, which is maybe what we would all expect, um, that the model is actually able to capture some of the heavy precipitation that's associated with um, extratropical cyclones, in part because uh, we, we these processes are well 
reasonably well resolved in the, in the model at these scales. But if you look at the other two types of precipitation that provide a lot of extreme precipitation over CONUS um, in tropical cyclones and mesoscale convective systems, you can see that conventional models are uh, uh, vir virtually create zero precipitation from these type of events, which means that if you're using this model to project future climate change and to try to understand what that means for precipitation extremes, you have to be a little bit cautious because it doesn't actually include uh, multiple pathways to the extreme precipitation producing events. Uh, and then we've done the same results where we look at these two different approaches um, uh, to high resolution climate modeling. And you can see that when we start to go to the, the MMF approach that we're able to start to capture some of these uh, precipitation by type from important things like a mesoscale convective systems as well as tropical cyclones. Um, but if you look at just the high resolution approach, while it does start to do a better job of actually simulating some aspects of the extra tropical cyclone heavy rainfall, um, it does still struggle with certain types. Um, and, and so I'm just, I'm gonna go over this really quick, but we did this for annual accumulated accumulation, but we can do this for the amount of rainfall per event type. Uh, and so here's just an example where you can see that mesoscale convective systems produce a lot of rainfall per, uh, you know, per instance. Um, and, uh, and that even for extratropical cyclones, a lot of their extreme precipitation comes in, in the, the frontal aspects of them. And so uh, you can see that, that that's also captured. But when you look at, again, conventional models or even the high resolution approaches, that there's varying skill and the ability to capture the extreme precipitation amounts per event. Um, and, and so what we've done with this approach is we started to say, okay, well, can we start to understand these biases in the model some? And so this is for these three different types uh, of um, climate simulations. Uh, in which we look for CONUS and we can see that, you know, we can look by storm type and we can start to explore, you know, is the error in the amount of rainfall or extreme rainfall, depending upon the metric you want to use uh, in the climate model, does it come from a lack of intensity in the model or does it come from an error in the number in simulating the number of events of the storm type you're interested in, right? So a model might have low rainfall in part because it doesn't simulate tropical cyclones or MCSs, which we know contribute to, to precipitation. And we can also start to do this um, at uh, national or NCA um, regions. And I'm just mentioning this because it's in the paper as well. You can actually start to explore the actual tails of the uh, amount distributions as well to try to explore, you know, how, why is it that some of the simulations are producing more extreme rates than others? But, um, and so the summary here is that this is kind of just new work in which we've been using to try to explore the different ways in which new approaches to climate modeling, um, at least, uh, you know, in the near future, um, what the impacts that it might have on precipitation and extreme precipitation by looking at storm type. Um, and this, this paper has a few main takeaways. But what I wanted to do is just finish the last few minutes with talking about another approach um, uh, to looking at, at precipitation changes in the future uh, by, by focusing on storm types. And so this is a storyline approach that we've developed uh, both within the community atmosphere model developed at NCAR, but also within E3SM at the Department of Energy, um, in which we start to run a series, we treat the climate model like a weather model. And so we run a series of seven day forecasts uh, in this case, because we focus on a specific type of event, in this case, a hurricane, we often uh, initialize the model at a specific times in advance of a hurricane landfall or throughout a hurricane season, uh, using the operational uh, initial conditions that go into the operational global forecast system. Um, and then we run a counterfactual. And this is which we, so very similar to the pseudo global warming that Christoph just mentioned, in which we update the large scale thermodynamic fields for temperature specific humidity and sea surface temperature. And we can look at, we can either do it where we look at 1850 and we look at uh, what the, the conditions would have been there, or we can look at the future. Um, and so this is just another way in which we, we've done this. So we've done this now for all of the 2020 hurricane season in which we've calculated the climate change signal. And we've removed this from our initial conditions and we run a series of forecasts. Now, in this case, we're running forecasts every three days through an entire hurricane season. So essentially we're creating a, um, a, a database of a bunch of plausible tracks. So of course there's a range in the different storms um, at the various initialization times, but we end up with this actual forecast of the world that was and this counterfactual forecast in this case of the world that, that could have been uh, without climate change. And then we're able to start to look at changes in the precipitation field. So this just shows the, the 
accumulated precipitation throughout the season. But what we can start to do is look at distributions of, of three hourly rain rates, or we've also done three day accumulations. Um, and we can start to dive into the differences between these. Um, and just to highlight one of the main examples that we've seen is that if you just look at the 2020 hurricane season as a whole, we've actually seen about a, a change in a 10% uh, in the most extreme rain rate. So the 99th percentile three hourly rainfall amounts um, within the, the counterfactual compared to the actual. Um, and so that suggests that there's been around a 10% plus or minus five change in those extreme rain rates. But this of course will be dependent upon as Christoph was mentioning the metric you might use uh, for extreme precipitation. And so this is just my final slide is that this, I was just highlighting how we've been using climate models now to look for uh, attribution like studies, but we've also started to do this to look at how does specific events, so you can take an event that was particularly damaging or produced a particularly large amount of rainfall in the historical past. Uh, and then we run these events under various future degrees of warming, um, such as a two degree warming, a three degree or a four degree global warming. Uh, and then we can look at characteristics in the change of the precipitation field. So this is, this is a, we have a study that we've just submitted that's focused on looking at Hurricane Irma uh, and looking, okay, how much more rainfall would fall in the future okay. in a well uh, Calvin, uh, yep. just interrupting, two minutes left. Thank yep. you. Um, and you can see that we see substantial increases in rainfall in a four degree warmer world compared to the present warming. Um, and, uh, and so typically, right, when we do these type of storyline simulations, you focus on the models that are well, or the, sorry, the simulations that are well produced the observations. So you often say, okay, this model well produces the location and the track of the storm. And so this is a good model to use to look at the potential impact of climate change. But one of the other things that we started to do is that actually by using storyline approaches, you can actually maybe look at these other types of tracks. So you can see in this example over here, these, these uh, orange and red ones, these are plausible tracks that were simulated at at uh, further lead times uh, and actually were compared to what the operational center was saying at the time. And that actually you could look at these models under or these, you know, maybe not well uh, simulated tracks, but maybe worst case tracks, for example, for the Miami region. And you could start to say, can we start to explore how rainfall would change in those in the future so that we can start to build up kind of these plausible landfalling storms to help um, broaden the sampling that could be used for projecting kind of precipitation extremes throughout the 21st century. So um, so there's just some high level summary and I'll actually stop and, and, uh, and hopefully take some questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Kevin. Wonderful talk and uh, good timing as well. So now I'm also going to, uh, maybe you can move back to your last slide yep. so we can see some of your summary point while we open up for questions. Any questions for Kevin? So so Kevin, maybe, maybe, maybe can you talk a little bit about your last point, like doing the storyline where you actually allow the track to deviate? So, so in that case, it really depends on the initial condition, I, I suppose, and, and probably the model formulation and many, many different things. So your idea is that you, by doing, by allowing the track to deviate from what has been observed, uh, then you would be able to quantify some uncertainty related to uh, future projection in terms of like uh, how widely spread out that possible storm might actually be producing extreme precipitation? Yeah, so so I'll use this as an example. If you kind of just look at the top plot here, this shows the tracks both in the actual and the counterfactual. And these are the ones that are included in our analysis. Uh, and in and typically in these type of storyline approaches that are focused on looking at the change in the intensity or the characteristic of a specific event, you often want to focus on right the simulations that, that well reproduce the observed storm. Um, and that's the common approach, but but there are you know dozens, if not in this case, hundreds of ensemble or hundreds of simulation members that we didn't actually analyze in this study because either they were initialized early in the storm, so because of the initial conditions, there was a little bit more uncertainty of where the storm would go, um, or because they just uh, for whatever reason interacted right with the dynamic large scale uh, circulation in a way in which took them to have slightly different tracks. Um, which makes it difficult to do that, you know, the apples to apples comparison for trying to understand changes in the storm itself. But if you actually start to look at those storms, you actually can increase the number of plausible, right, uh, tracks and therefore rainfall fields associated with these storms. Um, and the interest or the reason why that could be useful is that 
right? Variations in where a storm makes landfall or the speed, the translation of the, of the storm can have huge implications for the actual rainfall field and the rainfall extremes associated with it. Uh, and so the idea is that if we start focusing maybe on on these cases over here, these poorly simulated storms, that we will actually produce, you know, a broader set of what the actual range of precipitation might be for a Irma-like event in the future that maybe actually has this earlier forecast time come true. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if that kind of answers the question a little bit, but the idea is it's a synthetic way of producing more and more storms. Um, and it's worth noting, I'll just mention real quick, that this is actually a common um, aspect within the hurricane community um, that we use all the time. We use different types of statistical or statistical dynamical downscaling mm -hmm. techniques to, to come up with a range of potential tracks, both in the current climate and the future. And that's one of the ways in which they assess hurricane risk. Um, mm -hmm. And so the idea is that maybe you could start to do that with the more dynamical approaches and, and kind of, you know, get a better sampling of the potential uh, uh, landfalling storms. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. And and in, in fact, I see Effie's hand up. And I was also wondering like whether this might be something to do with transposition <laughs> as well. But in any case, Effie, please go ahead. Yeah, no, very nice talk. I was in intrigued by your plot that you brought the uh, you broke down the bias in error in the number versus error in amount and i was wondering if someone had enough events that have both the error in the number of events and then uh, error in amount what implications would that have for the frequency or exceedance probability of design events you see i might have many fewer events that will affect my frequency uh, of that event versus the amount, you see, is, is not straightforward in my mind. But if I had enough of these events that I have uh, broken down their bias in number versus amount, uh, the consequences for the design event, exceedance probability, um, would be something to study. Does you see yeah. what I mean? Yeah, so I think I, I understand what you're saying, and 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 yeah, and I think that that's one of the right one of the ways to think about it, right? Is that um, if you know, okay, let me think for a second, right? So if 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 your model can well simulate the specific event type, so it can produce the right amount of rainfall when you have the event, but the bias in the model is that it just doesn't have enough of the events exactly. that you could, right? So that's what I think you're yeah. articulating. Um, yeah. That that means that the model, if you knew why how it was biased in terms of the event, that it could still be really useful, um, right? If you, if you understand the implications of that. And I think that the answer to that is yes. Uh, but one, one of the things I'll just mention though, is you have to be careful because not all of these right, are, are not producing the model or the, the rainfall appropriately just because they have not the right number of events. So they do fall on this kind of one-to-one -one line to some extent, but it's not perfect. And so what we have looked is when we start looking at the different distributions, we mm -hmm. can see that some of them, not only are they not producing the right number of events, but their, their intensity of rainfall is also off. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Russ? Hey Kevin, uh, yeah, this is this is all really good stuff. Um, going back, I mean, I guess we're sort of here back to the to this the earlier part. I'll look forward to to reading this paper. Um, but I guess I'm curious whether you you know in this analysis or maybe just more generally, like it, it, is the analysis uh, capable of doing this right? Like for the purpose of this committee, the 95th percentile is not actually of much interest. It's something much, much, much higher than yeah. that. And so I wonder if you've, if you have looked at that with your analysis method or, or like what you see as the, the potential for, for insights at, at these even more extreme scales. Yeah. So that, that's a, that's a great question, Russ. And so if, you know, well, full disclosure for these simulations that I've shown it, we, we've selected the 95th percentile in part because they're, uh, development like simulations, right? So they are, they're only on the order of 10 years. Um, and that's, um, that's not because, I mean, in A, they are a little bit exp more expensive than the conventional run, but we, that was just the design of the project. Um, and so I think if you had longer term simulations, or if we wanted to, like we eventually do, right, wanted to apply this to the broader CMIP archive, um, then you could certainly focus on a more uh, extreme metric 
Um, and, you know, but what, what that is, it was still, I mean, the way we do this methodology is that we, we look for contiguous regions of extreme precipitation, which we define to be the 95th percentile for each grid point. And so you could, um, you know, come up with the 99th or the 99th point ninth. And so that's very doable. Um, but in terms of looking, you know, if you wanted to, to go anything much more extreme than that, it might be a little bit challenging depending upon the ensemble side. But this is actually, now I'm saying that out loud and I'm just realizing, right, well, this is, could be a great use actually of a lot of the large ensembles that are out there at conventional climate simulations would actually need to look at that mm -hmm. across those, you know, multiple modeling centers that have these large 30 plus member ensembles. So actually there might be a way to look at a much more extreme event if you had the right data set. Mm -hmm. Great, Wait. thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, so now we move to our second session. Um, so our speaker is Andre Prime, and he is going to more particularly talk about storm types, even though we have also, also already been uh, hearing a bit about that. Yeah. Andrea, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for yeah. allowing me to talk today. And I think I'll go back a little bit more to Christoph's talk, but now shifting the focus really over the US. So I, I use mostly kilometer scale models to look at extreme events. And um, I will focus on those three topics mostly um, that we were tasked to. And I wanted to start with the middle one. Can high resolution models provide actionable, actionable accurate representations of sub daily PMP for the US in the current climate? Um, when I looked at this immediately, I thought, no, let's change that and say extreme precipitation because it's really hard to evaluate if the PMP is correctly simulated, because often there are large uncertainties, but extreme events are a little bit more feasible. But I try to reach a breach to a PMP towards the end. So what, I, what I'm showing you here is um, a simulation that we finished a couple of months ago. This is a four kilometer wolf simulation for the, um, for the recent 40 years downscaling era five, and it's spectral nudged over, the, over North America. And what I, I'm looking at here <laughs> is the hourly extreme rainfall event, like the highest hourly rate every year over the last 40 years. And this is what we get from the co-op station, so our station record in the US. And this is basically what the model is showing us, and this is the difference. So generally, you see that there's a lot of blue, which I think is not too bad because we compare a grid spacing of four times four kilometers to a point observation. So you would expect a little bit low, but what I really like in this, in this um, simulation is actually it's very consistently blue. There are some pockets maybe in the middle Atlantic region, which is um, less blue, but it's consistently underestimating, which basically means no matter which storm type we're simulating, we're doing it fairly consistently well. So it means like down here, there are tropical cyclones, like Kevin alluded to that, MCSs or smaller scale thunderstorms in the mountains. They all seem to be simulated fairly well. This also holds if we go to more, more rare events, like this is the 10 year event now here. Um, and you see a similar picture. I also wanted to point out there are some really blue dots in here. And this is mostly because I think we still have some issues with the observational records. So I come back to that, that observations are not perfect either later on in the talk. A different way to look at this is to look at PDFs. We looked at those already. So this is showing you now for different climate regions in the US, this is the Northeast, uh, comparing three data sets. The first one is the co-op station data sets, and we're looking only at the grid cells of the co-op stations here. Then this is the 40-year simulation that we did with, with WOLF, which we call CONUS 404, is the red one, and stage four is the blue one. And you can see all of those fall fairly well along the observation. Like I would say co-op is really, the best observation that we have. And this is hourly rain rates over the last 40 years. So you can see this is really well simulated by the model. And this is showing you this for the same, well, for different climate regions. And actually in, in many of those regions, the, the red line is closer to co-ops than the stage four. Stage four, just to mention this, this is a radar-based data set that's corrected to gauges. So this is one of the best hourly rainfall data sets that we have over North America and globally, I would say. However, as you can see, for example, in some regions, this data set has some major issues. Um, so you, you cannot trust the data set blindly, for example, in the Great Basin, where, especially in the mountains where we have radar blocking, it's, it's not perfect. So you might argue that we tuned this model to work really well in North America, um, and this why my model tuning can be a problem also for future climate projections. So I also wanted to show you 
basically the same modeling system, how it works over South America. So we did really use the same wolf model setting in South America. And we're comparing here to this set of stations where we have hourly rainfall. This is only one year, but I think it's fairly representative. What you see here again is a PDF and immediately like the observations that we had here was GPM iMERGE is a satellite data set. And you can see it's way lower frequencies in the intense events. ERA-5, which is the best analysis that we have is down here. So it seems like WOLF, the red line, the high resolution WOLF simulation that we did is heavily overestimating rainfall. However, if you look at the stations that we have there, this is by far the best data set that we have. So it's exceeding the, the quality of the, the radar data by far and even like way better than ERA-5, which has a lot of data assimilated. So going back to the US, one of the concerns, and we talked about this already, if you look at this, this is 40 years of data, of course, we, we are really interested in extreme, extreme events. So this is, for example, for the Northeast region. If you look at the region, approximately a 10,000 year event or a thousand year event will be around 90 millimeters per hour, plus minus. So the question now is really, can the Kona simulation keep up to produce really well, um, high, high um, rainfall intensities, even for very rare events, or is there a bias emerging once we go to very, very rare events. It's very hard to, to evaluate. I, I think we talked about this during Christoph's talk. Um, what we did here, this is now really looking at weather forecasts that we did at, at NCAR, and we picked out some of the most intense events that we had in the forecasting period. This is, for example, Hurricane Harvey. I think one of those is a different day of Hurricane Harvey. There's the West Virginia flood, some very, very extreme events. And we evaluate the model forecast um, against stage four again, which is basically if there's no no bias, it's close to zero here. And you see like the rarer the event, the further right it is, of course. And you see like there is some dependency of the model bias to the rarity of the event, but overall it's fairly well confined. Like there's a large uncertainty also how this line should be. But overall, you don't see that the models are drifting off in any direction if you go to very rare events, which is very encouraging. So I wanted to show you um, one example of that. Um, the West Virginia flooding in 2016 was, I think, something on the one, one in the 500 year event, uh, really massive flash flooding in this region, very complex, um, was a complex meteorological situation, up, up, up uh, slope flow here, for example, the Appalachians are here in this region as well. And what you see here are different um, daily accumulations during this event, and only one of those is coming from observations, and the others are coming from weather forecasts with three kilometer wolf. And the point is really, it's really hard to tell which one is which. So the model is doing a pretty good um, job in representing the peak accumulation during this event. So this is actually the observations up here. And these are different versions of forecasts. And this is very similar to what Kevin said before. Um, you can see, for example, this is, I think that this was the best forecast according to uh, the peak accumulation. We have few forecasts that are very weak, but a few that are very intense. And as far as we can tell, the model, like these events, like the, the real event might have turned out like this event. So the point that I wanted to make here is really that we can use this ensemble forecasting framework to look at, at potential storms that might have happened. If, if the meteorolo meteorological situation would have been a little bit different. So I think this is very much in line with what Kevin said before. So I think there's also a big opportunity to learn from numerical weather forecasting when it comes to using these models and forecasting, because they have a lot of experience in how these models are simulating heavy events. And in the climate community, like these kind of approaches are now really emerging under the name of ensemble boosting. Um, so I think this is a really interesting way to use an extreme event that we observed, but really put some envelope around what this event might have ha looked like. And some of these possibilities might be even worse than the event that occurred. Since we are already in the Appalachian region, I also wanted to show you this result. This is again using very intense events in the Appalachian region. So um, the top 20 events over the last couple of years and looking at how the vertical gradient and extreme rainfall was captured. Again, zero would mean no bias, this is stage four. And what you can see here clearly that three and one kilometer simulations have a very nice vertical gradient. They put the rainfall in the right elevation band. If you only lose, use station-based observations like PRISM or yeah, um, GRIDMAT, LIVNA, 
these data sets, of course, like most of the stations are in the valley, so you have to extrapolate somehow. And in this case, um, we put too few precipitation in the valley and way too much on, on the higher peaks, which of course is a big, really, really big concern if you think about spatial representation of extreme rainfall. So I really wanted to stress out, we talked about this during Christoph's talk already, but in especially in our graphic regions, I think this can be a really big benefit to use this kind of models because our observational systems have really big problems and the station density is often very low in these regions. Coming to observational uncertainties, I just wanted to touch on this as well a little bit, because of course we have evaluate our models against observations and then we often say that there's a bias and the model doesn't do really well. We really have to keep in mind that the observations are not perfect either. So what I'm showing you here is the daily accumulation of a tropical storm bill when it made landfall in June 2015. I will highlight these four different observational data sets. Stage four is the one data set that I already mentioned. It's a radar based data set merged with, with station observations corrected. And you can see very high precipitation accumulation. So this was record breaking rainfall in southern Oklahoma and northern Texas in this case. Um, if you use a different data set, so this is the multi-radar, multi-sensor data set. This is probably the gold standard that we have in the U.S. when it comes to gridded high-resolution um, precipitation estimates. You can see that this pocket of heavy rainfall looks very, very different. Different, even though like we use a similar, like same radar data, they assimilate uh, um, additional information into their systems. But you can see it's it's definitely not the same. This is what PRISM looks like, the PRISM data set. PRISM uses stage four um, in their gridding. And you can see like this, this spot here looks similar, but along the coast, you miss a lot of these heavy pockets. And then this is what a, a grid a station only based data set would look like. So if you wouldn't have any radar information, you get something like that. So this is really just to highlight the station record that we have is not really capable of observing this peak hourly high resolution um, extreme rainfall rates that that we see, for example, in radar data, like radar observations and also in the models. So moving on to the, this, actually this first question, how well can climate models simulate different storm types? So I know Kevin talked about this and this is, I will have to confess, this is a little bit hand wavy and this is really open for discussions. So I would be happy to hear other people's opinion on that. But I think we can uh, put this on a diagram that's a little bit like this, like the large, the, the, the dark scale forcing, so the synoptic scale forcing, paraplanicity, low from low to high, and the spatial scale of the storm from small scale to large scale. And I would argue that storms that are um, up here in this corner have large scale forcing and are fairly large storms. This can be atmospheric rivers, extropical cyclones, frontally forced swell lines. Models do pretty well with those. That this is um, this is these are storms which are really well simulated. Then we have this intermediate class, and then down here it's really where it's getting a little bit tricky, where you have this uh, cloud bursts, so very local storms. Supercells can can be in this category as well. Um, this is one example, not for the U.S., but for actually for Japan, where they had a convergence of sea breezes, and you can see that the scale of this this accumulation is very very small, but it's going up to 600 millimeters. This this reminds me a little bit of the Fort Lauderdale flooding that we had um, a couple of weeks ago. And you can see they had to really go down to actually sub kilometer scale grid spacing to simulate these storms. This is just something to, to highlight. We have to be aware, like we, we often use four kilometer models and these very small scale storms might not be as well simulated. We have to be cautious of that and really make sure that we don't miss these the contribution of these kind of storms to PMP when we look at current and future climates. So moving to the last piece, uh, the climate change um, projections. So I think, I put this this way, what we would like to have, I think is global large ensemble transient kilometer scale climate simulations from an ensemble of models. Like this would be our wish and Christoph mentioned these kind of models and they might come online in 10 years. But what we currently have often is really deterministic runs, a single simulation of our, uh, sometimes we have small ensembles. Um, some of them have very small regions that they're covering or focusing on individual cases. Um, so it's it's really a patchwork of things that we have. 
uh, at high resolution. But I really like, and Kevin mentioned this before, this large ensemble framework, I think it's extremely valuable, can be extremely valuable for PMP estimates. So what this is, is basically you start a, a lot of- Andreas, system. two minutes left. Yeah, okay, I will speed up. Um, I won't go into the details. Large ensembles, I hope you you know what the systems are. It, it really allows you to, to estimate um, the internal variability and get really a large amount of data for a specific climate. You can use them in two ways. The storyline approach, this is what we already heard. Um, so you basically use something like a pseudo global warming or storyline. You perturb one event and you look at how it changes in the future. Um, Michael Weiner and uh, Patrick Cola, they, they use this approach for tropical cyclones. And maybe Michael is mentioning this uh, later on. This has a lot of, of benefits here, uh, low computational costs. It's fairly bias-free. You can evaluate the model um, against the observed storm, and it really allows you to get insights into process changes. Um, the, the, the downside is really that you're stuck with, with the storms that you have observed. So it it's really doesn't allow you to look at ex extremes that are not in the observational record. And this is really where the other approach comes in. You, you can screen through all these large ensemble members and pick out events that are simulated and downscale them to very high resolution. So this is a study that did this um, very successfully. And this is really allowing you to add events that we haven't observed so far. So this would be something like black swan events. And this is really the events that we have to uh, be worried about, but there are also a couple of downsides if you if you use these kind of of um, approaches. So coming to my summary, um, I wanted to give you concrete answers to these questions. How well can climate models simulate different storm types? I think larger storms that are large scale force are really well simulated. With smaller scale weekly uh, force storms, I think we have to be a little bit more cautious, even though like the models sometimes can really capture those as well. Um, Next, can high resolution models be used for extreme participation of PMP estimates? I will definitely say yes, um, especially if you have a well calibrated model. You can really get to quality data quality that's within the observational uncertainty. And what are the key challenges? I think it's really the sampling of the large uncertainty space that we have in the future. Uh, we have to find ways to deal with the GCM biases if we look at events uh, that we directly downscale from GCMs and how we account for black swan events is, is really not that trivial. So how do you find those in the GCMs? Are they realistic? And can you bias correct those if they are not um, realistic? So last slide, just a couple of things, additional considerations. Um, I think kilometer scale models are really interesting because they can help you to boost the observational records. You can simulate events that you haven't seen before. And I think this is really what we need because this black swan events, like sometimes we see events that occur and we think we never thought that this is possible, but exactly these kind of events are the events that we should be interested in if we think about PMP. And then the last point is really collaboration is key. Uh, I think learning from the forecasting community, we use forecasting models, like Christoph is using a weather forecasting model. I use Wolf, which is often used in weather forecasting. Uh, of course, paleoclimate study, um, bringing paleoclimate people is important. Statisticians that we have to, like how to estimate PMPs from these return value events is not trivial. And then storm transportation methods. And the last one is really, we need more coordinated kilometer scale modeling activities in the US. Like what Christoph showed, they had activities in Europe where they really jointly ran some simulations. This is not happening in the US. And I think we really have to change this to, to make these simulations more comparable and more useful for really doing things that you were tasked to do with the PMP estimates. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Andreas. That's a wonderful talk. Um, so now we open for um, questions. But before I see any hands up, I would <laughs> like to um, first maybe ask one question. So, so Andreas, I think it, it is quite clear from your presentation as well as from our previous two, two speakers that we really need ensemble modeling, right? So. But but of course, ensemble modeling would be very expensive. Uh, so so can you maybe comment a little bit, like with limited 
or, or even with a lot of computing resources that we have, what are your priorities in terms of creating the, this ensemble? Because you can perturb initial condition, you can perturb, you can use different models, you can even select a different types of storms. So, so there's many ways of doing that. And what, what might be your, like, hey, this, these are the things I really would like to, to have. Yeah, I think like to be, if you really want to be computational efficient, it's of course the best way would be to focus on extreme events. Like if you run mm -hmm. fancy and simulations, 99.9% .9 of the time you don't have an extreme. So if you mm -hmm. can't focus on extremes, you already save a lot of resources. So this is easy if you look at historic extremes that we that we observed. And I think this would be a low hanging fruit to run ensembles of perturbed forecasts or um, modeling simulations for really this high impact storms in different regions. And then I think it would be really interesting to like searching for extreme weather patterns in global large ensembles and downscaling those patterns specifically. The danger is really that these patterns will be often associated with large scale forcing. So you might miss things like this Fort Lauderdale flood, mm -hmm. like these very small extreme events that have not really large scale fingerprints. So, but I think there's definitely some some work that we can do to improve that. Right. I, 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 yeah. I also like very much this kind of approach where you perturb a set of historical storms, but but you might potentially miss the black swan because a storm historically that wasn't the best, that wasn't the worst, could become the worst <laughs> in the future or something like that. Uh -huh. Very true. Yeah. Great. Okay, so, uh, Jim. Andreas, very helpful. Um, question um, on um, weak forcing and uh, Appalachian setting. Um, the upper Ohio Valley along the western margin uh, of the Appalachians, it uh, has some of the largest rainfall accumulations in the world at timescales less than six hours uh, and dominates probable maximum precipitation and it's mainly weak uh, forcing events. Um, you, you've shown that uh, in simulating the climatology of mesoscale convective systems, th there's a low bias uh, for those midsummer weak um, uh, forcing events. What, what are the prospects for doing a better job uh, with, uh, with that, that climatology? Yeah, thanks for bringing this up. Um, so we actually improved the model quite a bit concerning this low bias, it was in, in the wolf system mainly related to land atmosphere coupling. You basically drifted off into a very arid climate in the central US during summertime. And doing a better job with land surface processes really helped us to increase the numbers of MCSs in the late summer season. So the simulations that I showed you here don't have the severe bias anymore. Um, but yeah, very true. Like we, we should really look at, I liked your question about these pockets of heavy rainfall in the Alps. And I think this is something we haven't looked at at this simulation. So this is, would be very important and helpful to evaluate if we can simulate those pockets of hotspots, um, similar to what Christoph showed in, in the Appalachians, but also in, in the Rockies. Thanks. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, John? Yeah, um, a comment, which I'll let you comment on, and then the question. Um, so I think the idea of, you know, running ensembles on situations that are uh, maybe set up to produce very high precipitation amounts it is a good one. And the obvious thing to look at is uh, high precipitable water amounts, for example. But um, I don't think I share your pessimism regarding capturing things like Fort Lauderdale, because you can... Fort Lauderdale was unusual in the the projected storm motion was almost stationary. So yeah. if you're looking for those sorts of things, you can catch that aspect of the extremes as well. Um, and then my question is, um, I'm I'm old enough to remember when we couldn't really forecast uh, extratropical cyclone, the intense extratropical cyclones with numerical models very well, and then then finally we could, and then we were over forecasting them. Uh, we made it to the could part of the extreme. Are you concerned at all that as we get further along, we'll discover that now we have to deal with flaws that in within the microphysics and so forth that are making the processes inaccurate? Yeah, yeah, I fully agree. Like, I think this is the, the big benefit of using convection permitting models. Like, you get rid of a lot of these prioritized processes that have a lot of errors. Like, especially deep convection is a big, big problem. And then 
yeah, now the microphysics play a much bigger role. And so I think, like I also tried to highlight this at my conclusions, I think a well calibrated model is really key. Like you can with four, for example, very easily change the, the physics settings. And you can see that you get quite a large spread independent which physics you use. Um, so you really, and again, like this is really helpful to talk to forecasting community because they do do this parameter testing and, and physics testing quite a bit and have large experience in how to set up the model well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Are there any other questions? Okay, so if not, I think we can take a break right now for about five minutes and then we come back and, and we'll have our uh, panel discussion starting with three speakers who would particularly uh, talk about uncertainty and then we welcome uh, other speakers to, to also join the panel and then have a discussion about uncertainty. So, so with that, so we'll come back in about five minutes, which is uh, roughly, let's say 12.35 uh, Pacific time. All right. Thank you. See you all again. Ruby, there is a oh. okay. yes. Uh -huh. There was a question for Andreas from. Andrew. Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, from I'm sorry. From who again? I didn't see a hand. What should we ask it? Um, let me just. I can. I can read that question. It's from. Okay. Kate. Um, it says, "What uh, for Andres? What type of modeling experience experiments would you design to explore forcing mechanisms that produce PMP type storms that have not been observed in the historical record? Meaning, what if I what if I look for an alternative to a PGW or story storyline approach? I want to explore alternative or new mechanisms for PMP type events." That's a very good question. I think an active area of research, like the large ensemble approach is again, I think a very good one. For example, in our new large ensemble, which has a hundred members, there is a, a tropical cyclone hitting California. And we know like historically this can happen, but we don't have one in, in, the, in our like observational record. Um, so you could at least for, if you have some kind of large scale proxy fingerprint of extreme events, you can search for those fingerprints in coarse resolution models and hope that these models can reproduce those fingerprints and then downscale those situations. But again, you have to rely on these fingerprints of finding these large scale situations, which is not trivial. So there's definitely, I think, uh, urgent need to do some research in this area. All right, thank you very much. So now we have exactly five minutes <laughs> for our, for our uh, break. So please come back uh, in five minutes, uh, 12.35 uh, Pacific time. We'll see you again. Bye.
This is Michael. I'd just like to test my audio. Can anybody hear me? Yep. Uh-huh. Yes, I can hear you. Uh-huh. Good. I realized I forgot to do it earlier. <laughs> no, thanks. Thank you. So are we starting uh, live streaming soon? I'm just curious. I think so. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I'm I'm ready whenever you are. Yeah, I huh? I am, huh? Thanks. Okay, so um, I'm going ahead and get start with the countdown. So starting from five, four, three, two, one. All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, th so this is our last session of the day, and it will be a panel discussion on uncertainty in simulating extreme precipitation. So we will ask each panelist to first speak for about five minutes. And then we will go into questions for the whole panel, including um, uh, the previous speakers as well. So our first uh, panelist is Paul Ulrich from UC Davis. Paul? Can everybody see that OK? Uh -huh, yep. OK. Sounds good. All right. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk. Uh, I'm going to try to kind of bridge uh, our previous discussion on um, different modeling techniques and discussing uh, some aspects related to uncertainty. Particularly, I'm going to focus very briefly on um, the usage of storyline simulations and give some of the examples that we use uh, in the hyperfacets project in order to assess future changes in precipitation extremes. Um, so We've heard a little bit about storyline simulations already, um, but just to emphasize these, um, these storylines are basically based on events or periods of significant impact from history. And so basically historical examples where we've seen uh, extreme precipitation events as they have occurred. And of course, there's some debate as to how close we get to the PMP uh, level of extreme precipitation over the historical record. But I would say that it makes sense that if you consider basically worldwide uh, extreme precipitation events as they have occurred, um, then we have some pretty good idea of what this relationship is between the intensity of or the total accumulation of precipitation and the duration of those precipitation events. And so we can leverage those historical events in order to develop, uh, in order to basically understand future change in those uh, events as well. And part of that work involves, of course, this assessment, whether or not models are actually doing a good job of assessing it. And we've heard already a lot of discussion on um, the quality of our modeling systems and how they've improved dramatically over the past several decades for simulating some of these very important extremes. In the Hyperfastest project, we're assessing a number of storylines targeting uh, important high impact events across the CONUS, uh, including everything from drought to uh, windstorms uh, in the east. Uh, the two I'm going to be talking about today are atmospheric rivers and uh, derecho events in order to get that basically discrepancy in scales from the large scale uh, precipitation event driven by an atmospheric river and a finer scale convective precipitation event. Uh, and each of these are gonna be simulated in the regionally refined E3SM uh, model. So the first event that I wanna talk about is the 1997 New Year's flood event, which was a major atmospheric river that caused widespread flooding across California and caused many uh, gauge stations to basically hit their uh, overall record. This is both for stream flow and for overall precipitation event, uh, precipitation amount and cause subsequent very uh, strong impacts on uh, very high in infrastructural damage as well related to this event. In order to simulate this event, um, we used, again, the regionally refined E3SM, which is this global climate modeling system with embedded high resolution placed over California. Uh, and with re with uh, this higher resolution, then we were better able to capture uh, topographic features. And as Andreas kind of alluded to earlier, um, we developed basically an ensemble of uh, forecasts from this event driven by different initial conditions, and then subsequently simulated this at different warming levels to see what the sensitivity was of the precipitation to the upstream, uh, to the warming. Um, if you look at this figure now in the bottom middle here, this actually shows a comparison of model performance versus precipitation gauges and other observational data sets. And I would say that kind of what uh, Andreas also alluded to earlier, our biggest issue is having observational data that is actually able to capture these uh, extreme events. 
Um, so while we have confidence that the models are actually doing a decent job, it's very difficult in order to make conclusive statements on that because we don't have the benchmarking data sets necessary to, uh, or at least the uncertainties in those bench benchmarking data sets are too large for us to really state very clearly that this is a good representation of the event as it occurred historically. Nonetheless, if we look at the precipitation gauge record over California during this event and compare that to this 3.5 kilometer regionally refined simulation, you'll see that there's a pretty good match, particularly at the peak of the, the sum total precipitation amount here. So that does indicate that as we go to finer and finer resolution, and as we kind of enter into this single digit kilometer scale regime that we're actually capturing total precipitation amount at the levels that we would need to in order to estimate PMP successfully. And we can also see basically a natural response here of um, the overall total precipitation amount to warming. And so what we're seeing is basically a 5% increase in mean precipitation, which again, accords very well with uh, Christoph's comment earlier about how extreme precipitation is changing into the future. And it allows us to then make more confident statements about that multiplicative factor on how much extreme precipitation, how much PMP is basically changing in response to climate change. The second event that I wanted to talk about was the 2012 North American Duresho, which began as basically a small storm cluster centered over Wisconsin, Minnesota area on um, the 29th of June in 2012, and it basically passed over much of the eastern U.S. Although Dureshos are perhaps most widely known for extreme winds, they are also a form of mass scale convective system that delivers with them extreme precipitation as well. And so here we wanted to make sure that even this climate modeling system was able to capture the most extreme precipitation from these Duresho events. And what we generally see is that, yes, the model actually does a pretty decent job. Again, the issue that we have in order to make confident statements about the model quality is related to the quality of our observational products. So here, what we see is that if you look at the mean error, basically at 6.5 kilometer and 3.25 kilometer simulation in the regionally refined region, we underestimate the precipitation amount relative to stage four. At 1.625, we actually overestimate the precipitation amount here, but we are getting closer to see morph and iMERGE as comparison precipitation products. Given that there's a large spread in observational products, it's very difficult to say whether or not the model is, again, producing the correct amount of precipitation consistent with reality, but we can say that we seem to be at doing a much better job of capturing these high precipitation amounts and kind of this one to three kilometer regime is where we generally want to be with models even to capture these convective storm systems. So getting back to some of the questions that we're addressing in this session, how well do models capture PMP magnitude events across different storm types? Again, these are my personal opinion on the matter. For most of the examples considered, I would say that models generally fall within the observational spread. Um, and I think that they're pretty robust in terms of overall predictions of probable maximum precipitation, uh, independent of storm type. Uh, once you have sufficient resolution within the model, and once you, of course, deal with some of these issues with atmosphere land coupling. How well do they capture rainfall extremes and complex terrain? It's a very difficult question to answer because at fine resolutions, we can simulate kind of these short duration summertime convective storm events in the models, but we don't have um, confidence in the observational data in order to benchmark those precipitation amounts. As Andreas kind of referred to or uh, uh, mentioned earlier, you have issues with like radar blocking that prevents us from getting very good estimates of um, total precipitation amounts associated with these storms. And so it's difficult to benchmark them exa exactly. How well do they capture it? rainfall extremes in the absence of topographic forcing, I would say that we're doing a pretty good job, honestly. Um, I, I, I am, am impressed at some of the performance that the models are producing, particularly for these mesoscale convective system events. In terms of recommendations, um, how does spatial and temporal scale affect how well models simulate PMP magnitude rainfall? I would say that Historically, researchers have generally reduced the resolution in their models uh, to finer and finer resolution in order in, until things look reasonable and then generally stop because of computational limitations. I think there hasn't been a lot of work done on pushing the models to even finer scales. I think this was alluded to earlier as well. Um, and so we need to be confident that there is convergence in the models as they get to fine scales when it comes to PMP. How can large ensemble simulations be used to inform sources and magnitudes of uncertainties? Uh, and so again, getting to this uncertainty question, I think that there's a desperate need for long duration cloud resolving simulations over the US. This has already been mentioned once. Presently available large ensembles are too coarse in order to say anything about um, these black swan um, high intensity extreme precipitation events. And so we need to have uh, better large ensembles to answer these questions. And how can we estimate PMP in a future climate in this PGW framework? 
there's a, a large ensemble of the PGW simulations basically allow us to constrain that multiplicative factor associated with PMP. And I think that we're going to be leveraging that primarily in order to uh, draw out the statistics of PMP over the whole length of possible durations. Um, we do need these large ensembles in order to identify possible hazards. But again, as I alluded to at the beginning, worldwide, we've seen so many extreme precipitation events that they tell a pretty good story about the relationship between event duration and uh, event intensity. So this figure was distributed as part of the, the notes associated with this session. I think that it's really important to be able to reproduce this figure in our models. One of the shortfalls that, I'm, that, that make this very difficult in the modeling community is that we don't output high frequency precipitation uh, intensities, that is sub-hourly. It's even hard sometimes to find sub-daily precipitation amounts. And so pushing the community towards outputting very fine frequency precipitation amounts will allow us to truly assess how well our models are at capturing these short duration extreme precipitation episodes and whether or not they're getting those corresponding processes correct. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if we draw upon the global sample of extreme events as they have occurred over the historical record, we may be able to derive the statistics or interpolate the statistics of these extreme black swan events um, horizontally through, through this distribution in order to understand more about um, what PMP might look like for black swan events. Great, thank you very much, Paul. So now we move to uh, Kristen uh, from Colorado State University. Okay, can you hear me and see my slide? Uh -huh. Yep. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation and this is a really great uh, discussion today. I'd like to add uh, some additional thoughts on what has been talked about before. Uh, okay, so this, is, this was just actually shown by Paul. I wanna go back to the ingredients-based flash flooding forecasting framework uh, produced by Doswell et al. in 1996, where precipitation is the product of the average rainfall rate and the duration. Basically, the heaviest rainfall is falling where um, these high rainfall rates are located for the longest time. And if we think about this in this uh, intensity and duration framework, similar to what was just shown, there is actually a wide spectrum of events uh, that can produce heavy rainfall and extreme rainfall. Uh, here's an example from the precip field campaign that happened in Taiwan uh, last summer, where there's a wide range across, you know, strong vertical forcing events and also long horizontal, strong horizontal forcing events um, that produce uh, extreme rainfall from really deep convective systems that are local in scale all the way out through tropical cyclones and these bigger, broader kind of stratiform precipitation systems that may last a really, really long time. And so considering the modes and, the, and these different types of uh, spectrums that we can see is actually quite important. Now, if we look and we gain information on this spectrum from in, the information from the very first spaceborne precipitation radar uh, aboard the TRIM satellite that orbited for 16 years across the uh, entire tropics and subtropics, we can look and see where these storm modes occur kind of in an observational framework. And you can see there's a wide variety of where we see the, the biggest deep convective storms here in the middle panel and the organized systems more representative of mesoscale convective systems on the bottom. So uh, if we think about the research at the intersection of weather and climate in the context of understanding extreme precipitation, uh, I would argue that to understand the spectrum of storms, we really need to consider models across scales um, and their environments as well. And so uh, one way that, that some of my work has been uh, aimed at this uh, question is to really think about convection permitting regional climate simulations, where we're actually trying to represent the, the spectrum of systems in their natural environments in a current and a future climate. So uh, the pseudo-global warming technique was mentioned by Christoph Schar earlier and also Andreas. I'll use this example simulation set 13 years in the current climate over the contiguous United States shown on the right. Uh, uh, for a 13 year period in the control simulation and a pseudo global warming uh, uh, simulation for that same 13 year period with that climate delta change signal from a 30 year mean in the future and a 30 year mean uh, in the current climate. We apply that change and then drive the simulation again. So one of the things that were noticed from an analysis of this simulation was that uh, we're getting really great uh, uh, um, estimates of precipitation. Andreas gave a nice uh, talk on that. We also see resolving uh, some of these topographic features at this four kilometer grid spacing. Orographic precipitation is much better represented as re represented by some snow tell uh, snow observations compared to the simulations. We're also getting diurnal and seasonal cycles of organized systems. We're getting propagating mesoscale convective systems that maximize in the nocturnal hours. You see examples here on the right. And it, we're allowing convection to uh, naturally evolve in its environment. And so we're getting a better answer with these particular storm modes um, 
We also looked at how these particular systems change from weak systems. These are radar reflectivity differences from very weak systems on the top right all the way through really intense radar reflectivities on the bottom right, showing that we're seeing actually broad decreases in the weak to moderate convective population. But then as we scope to more and more um, uh, intense reflectivity ranges, we see increases in, uh, in these ranges. And so this is an interesting shift in the convective population. We've also looked at storm modes specifically in these CONUS simulations. This is an example from the 2011 super outbreak of tornadoes across uh, some of the Midwest of the United States. And we've compared some of these specific storm modes uh, to GPM. This is the follow-on uh, precipitation satellite in space. Um, these same storm modes in the GPM observations on the top row and the CONUS control simulation on the bottom. We're finding broad agreements, but we're seeing these, these different types of storm modes from deep systems through wide systems and their intersection across regions across, uh, in the United States. Now, I will note that we've done similar analysis in the South America simulation, and we do see some challenges in representing storm modes in tropical rainforests like the Amazon. So there's some information there in terms of uncertainty. Okay, when we look at how these storm modes change, uh, basically taking that difference in from the current and the future climate, and we see actually really, really large increases in the number of these specific storm modes as we go uh, in a current future climate. So if we map this back onto that intensity duration framework, we can think about how, what this means in terms of changes in those extreme precipitation values. Speaking of extremes, I want to focus quickly here on looking at specific extremes in these simulations. And my uh, previous PhD student, Aaron Doherty, did some great analysis looking specifically at 584 flash flood events across the United States in that 13 year period. Uh, and what we find is if we if we look at maximum uh, rain rates within just the storms that produce that flash flood rainfall, uh, we do see that those rates are actually uh, shifting to the right. The, the PGW uh, distribution is here in the red. And, I, and we've mapped this into the percent change per Kelvin. And you actually see that when we specifically highlight very extreme flash flood producing systems, we actually do get a um, scaling that, that goes beyond the classius clapron scaling, leading to the important role in, in considering the important role of thermodynamics and dynamic changes in these systems in a future climate. We also looked at area average rainfall. We see that these systems are overall producing more average rainfall in a future climate. And so I go back to this, uh, that you know it's really important to consider the spectrum of storms producing extreme rainfall. There's a wide variety of systems that do so. But uh, one of the things that we've had challenges with uh, is it's very hard to assess uncertainty due to computational constraints in this convection permitting framework. We've heard lots of discussions on ensembles and new approaches to do this. I'm really excited about these opportunities and these types of, of, uh, of new tools uh, in the future to try to assess uncertainty in these convection permitting frameworks. Um, okay, so uh, we're considering, uh, it's very important to consider strengths and also weaknesses of this extreme precipitation estimation and models across scales. I'll leave you with this uh, framework here, that if we're thinking about extreme precipitation estimation in general, if we think about satellite observations, um, we have uh, really, oops, it looks like my animation is broken here. Hold on, let me scope through here. Sorry about that. Um, that these satellite observations provide broad coverage. We look at three-dimensional structures, but we only see snapshots in time. When we scope down to these regional climate models, we have really good seasonal diurnal cycle of precipitation. We do see storm modes that are reproduced relative to current observations. We, we do see good represent, representations of orographic precipitation, but often we only have one estimation of these future climate simulations, especially if we have really long-term 13 you know, and 20-year types of simulations. Global climate models, as has been discussed today too, they actually really well represent the thermodynamic environment supporting extreme storms. There's large ensemble uh, types of simulations that are available. Uh, they do represent changes in storm tracks uh, through the climate dynamic framework, uh, but they do have challenges in representing these storm modes. So I think all of this is important considering how we estimate precipitation, extreme precipitation from models across scales. So I'll end there and thank you for uh, your time. Wonderful, thank you very much, Kristen. So now we go to our Last uh, panelist, uh, Michael Weiner from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Thank you, Ruby. Let me just bring up my presentation. And you can see that, I hope. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. yep. All right. So as much as I'd like to talk about uh, Super Clausius Clapeyron and event attribution and storyline, I'm not. I'm going to talk about statistical models. And the question was asked, can climate models be used to calculate PMP in current and future climates? I'd like to ask that about statistical models. Uh, here's my standard disclaimer, I'm only speaking for myself. 
So let's, for those of you who don't know about extreme value statistics, this is a just a brief pictorial of it. There's the equation for the generalized extreme value distribution. And this is what it looks like, the probability density for various um, uh, values of what's called the shape parameter. And so extreme value theory is a very uh, well-established theory for the describing the tails of distributions. And um, it's a three-parameter distribution, and the so-called shape parameter Xc determines the, the, the upper tail of this distribution of the tail of ordinary distributions. And so there are really three kinds. The, if that shape parameter is zero, it's called the Gumbel distribution, and it goes out to infinity. If, if the shape parameter is positive, it is unbounded at infinity um, and finite at infinity, if it's large enough. And if it's less than zero, then it has a sharp bound. And uh, you can see that one uh, taken from Wikipedia for a, a rel relatively large uh, negative shape parameter, the green one of minus one half. When, when we, we, we can use this to calculate return values and return times, and you see that for uh, the three different uh, shape, uh, three different categories of the shape parameter. And um, uh, as return value, um, uh, as return time goes up, the, 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 you know, how rare the event is, if the, param if the shape parameter is negative and it's bounded, then these um, plots of return time would, a return value rather, would also be bounded. And one could calculate that um, and that would be one way of estimating the probable mass of maximum precipitation. So um, this is a problem that's bothered me for about 20 years, and, and it's nice to have this opportunity to think about it again. And I went back to a paper that I wrote some time ago that hasn't been published, where we had an experiment of 2,364 simulations of just 1990. And so the beauty of this was, although it was rather coarse, it is completely stationary and uh, IID, independent and identically distributed. And we divided this up into uh, four regions of the Western United States. We had a, a coastal region, a desert region, a Great Plains uh, region, and an upper Midwest. And um, they were defined based on their mean and vari variability characteristics. And when we calculate this, this use these um, the data from these experiments to calculate return value uh, compare, compare, uh, as a function of return time for these different regions, only the Pacific coast is a bounded distribution. You can see this is not large, 2000 years is not large enough to, to estimate um, from this picture where it's gonna saturate, but at least it's turned over. And indeed, this is the only one of these four regions that had a negative shape parameter. So the other three are unbounded with 2,364 years. Now, this bothered me for a long time, but I think I finally understand now that, that the GEV, the Generalized Extreme Value Distribution, is indeed fit for purpose to describe a long-tailed but bounded distribution, which, which precipitation must be, um, if the shape parameter is, is negative but small. And so um, to summarize these four regions, the Pacific Coast region was bounded. That had that had a, a, a high max, a mean a maximum, a high variability, and a high a return value. Whereas, say, the Southwest had a very low mean uh, maximum, maximum mean temperature, mean precipitation, but a very high uh, long period return value. And then the others had different variability characteristics. Um, this is a, a picture just describing sort of what what I mean by this thing is fit for purpose. This, this is a picture that Mark Risher just made yesterday showing um, this distribution with small uh, shape parameters. And this one of 0 0.05, 0 0.05 is actually what I got for the Pacific Coast region. And so you can see it's got a really long tail where it's really close to zero, but not zero out in this case to, to 20 in this normalized unit. But then beyond that it is defined as be zero. So, when we fit observed precipitation or even model precipitation, you know, more often than not, it's unbounded. And that's unphysical because the, the probable maximum precipitation can't be infinite. It, it just can't be. But if it is indeed bounded, like it is in this case, we can use Bayesian methods to estimate the upper bound of the upper bound. You know, so let's say like the, 
the five percent significant level you know what is that upper bound and Li Kung Zhang has been doing this with temperatures so those those methodologies would transfer directly um and so I think that in order to get this from climate model days we'd have to have thousands of years of uh, thousands of simulated years depending on the region and these very very different variability characteristics and I and I think I believe now, and I'd like to test this more with the large ensembles. The large ensemble has one of them has six thousand years. It's non-stationary. That throws a wrench in the works, but I think it's still good. But I think the true shape parameter is probably negative, but very small. You know, somewhere between you know just a little over zero and and, um, and zero point five. Um, as far as best, pra best practices, because these data sets. The large ensemble data sets are going to be non-stationary. We need to have multiple covariates. Mark Brister has written about this recently. Um, we can get away with a lot of covariates to account for different uh, uh, forms of, of non-stationarity, both human and, and natural. And also, I think these, the, the analyses have to be done on seasonal maximums rather than, an, than annual, or else the data is not independent and identically distributed, especially identical, because as we've seen, winter storms are different than summer storms. And in fact, I think it would be better, as we've seen today in these other talks, that we really should should um, footprint these storms in these simulations and consider the different storm types separately, because there's no reason to believe that the statistics of these storms are the same or that the mechanism of the change would be. And so, you know, this this is sort of some cold water on on the idea of using ensembles, because the number of years of observations will never be large enough to get bounded distributions. And the number of, of simulated years in convective permitting models is not going to be 10,000 for a long time. But there is this one opportunity that, that I think is worth investigating, and it's to borrow some advanced statistical techniques that have been used to estimate a maximum earthquake magnitude or the maximum human lifespan. You know, you can't live forever, and earthquakes can't be infinitely large. And so there is a there is a technology there um, that has been applied um, rather successfully, at least in human lifespan, and I think in earthquakes as well. Um, but that's going to require um, statisticians who are much much better than I am. And so, thank you. All right, thank you very much. So I want to thank all three panelists uh, for their wonderful presentation, and I would like to open up for questions before I perhaps ask a few more general questions that um, all of the speakers and the panelists uh, can contribute to the discussion. So, so for now, um, I'm, I'm opening up to see if there are any questions for any of our panelists. Okay, so I haven't seen a hand yet. Uh, so, so there might be some specific questions that come up uh, later, but I, I'd like to maybe throw out a few questions for the panelists, um, as well as our previous speaker, a bit more general, but I think it would help us, uh, the committee, to think about how we recommend uh, the path going forward. Um, well, maybe Jim, yeah, okay, go ahead, Jim, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ruby. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, so I think there are a few questions that we have heard, right? So so many of you have talked about lower resolution model, but also very, very high resolution model. So my first question is, are there ways that we can combine the advantages and disadvantages of this low and high resolution model to really give us a better estimate of extreme precipitation as um, or, or PMP uh, more specifically? So, so the quest first question is, how do we take advantage of like both low and high resolution model? My second question is related to what Michael just talked about in terms of statistics. It seems to me that we ought to be able to also take advantage of both both modeling and statistical theory to help us. So, so I would like to hear comments about how these two different ways of thinking, the modeling and statistics, to help us better bound uncertainty and better get estimate of um, extreme precipitation. And then the third question, which I, I've also previously asked uh, Andrea uh, uh, a bit before is, can you help us think about how to build the ensemble 
because it seems like there are many ways to build it and it's very computationally expensive. And, and I would like to hear from, from, from many of you um, your comments about how, how to build this ensemble. Um, and then I think we also have an important question about black swan. How do we get at the black swan or the gray swan type of problem? And then lastly, I, I would like to uh, come back to a question related to the super clausius clapperon. I think it's a very important question because if we do know that the maximum is really the CC, I think <laughs> I think that gives us a very strong constraint. But if that is not the case, then I think our, our task would be quite a bit more difficult because I we don't know like how much higher, you know, is it is it like doubling the CC rate or or what? Right. So so I'd like to hear some thoughts in that regard and how we might narrow the uncertainty related to this Clausius Clapperon to, to better understand what might be a possible maximum. Uh, or the limit of what, what that might be. So these are some of the questions that I'm throwing <laughs> at all of you. And I would like to see if any of you like to answer any any one of those questions. Yeah. So I see two hands up. Uh, so Jim, please go ahead first now. Uh, no, I was, I was, I had another que question. So mm -hmm. after all those are answered, I have another question. Great. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, Michael, do you, uh, is your hand related to? Yeah, it is, mm -hmm. and, and it's it's about superclasses clapperon, mm -hmm. and um, and perhaps this is some way we could use high and low resolution models. You know, I I think the only thing low resolution models are going to tell us is changes in large scale meteorology. I I don't really believe it informs us directly about um, extreme precipitation, um, partly because it doesn't as as Kevin showed, it doesn't even make the kinds of storms that produce extreme precipitation particularly well. Um, some of them not at all. Um, so that high resolution models are the only way we're gonna get at that. Um, but I, I think, you know, what we've been doing with event attribution and, and, and Kevin and I and others have written a lot on this is trying to understand what the processes are. You know, so we certainly know that saturated, fully saturated atmospheres increase at humidity at um, specific humidity at Clausius Clapron. And then the question is, are storms becoming more efficient at, at raining that out? And um, for and that's where I think the modeling really can help us understand if there are physical things happening, you know, which are, which are probably local dynamics, so not large scale dynamics, but local storm dynamics. Um, in the case of, um, of tropical cyclones, it's my feeling that the winds are a little bit stronger so it's a little bit more intense storm. We haven't detected that because it's a noisy field and probably we're not looking at it right. But that's that's a plausible physical mechanism for why event attribution studies of tropical of extreme uh, intense tropical cyclones more often than not, if not all the time, show a super Clausius behavior, Clausius behavior of two to three times that 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 rate for the most extreme precipitation in the most extreme storms. Now, other storms would have different mechanisms. Um, you know, there's mm -hmm. been some po some posited for for atmospheric rivers by you, um, and 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 for MCSs by 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 Andy. I think um, so. Uh, that's where I think we we need to use these models to gain our understanding and then develop theories about how we can scale with temperature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Michael. And I see two other hands up for now: uh, Christoph and then Kristen. Yeah. Chris, huh? Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for these three presentations. This was a very interesting and inspiring. I uh, like the question you raised, Ruby, about the importance to find out whether the super CC scaling exists or, or whether it does not. I And uh, it appears to me that we do a lot of model intercomparisons and it might be a good location actually to do one more in the comparison you, and there are different ways one one could do that one could have one model running different pgw versions and one could have but one could also have different models running the same pgw version i think this would help us to understand why our results uh, differ to some extent and whether 
even speaking, we have different beliefs regarding the, the role of disease scaling. I, I definitely think that it could be a comparatively small intercomparison if uh, a couple of groups or one group does uh, these simulations. A few years of simulations would be sufficient to find out whether these differences are really due to the whether these differences or the super CC scaling does exist or whether there are differences due to different treatments of PGW. I would just like to raise one concern. I, I know of a number of papers, including those in Nature Climate Change, a number of papers, none, none of them <laughs> written by any of you, which, which use PGW with a un uniform temperature. In, in the vertical, and that's just unrealistic because in climate change, we will see changes in stratification due to the fact of the moist elevatic, to changes in moist elevatic lapse rate. And so if we just take a, a temperature and humidity changes and not account for the associated stratification changes, we really run the risk mm -hmm. of overestimating uh, or underestimating certain things. There has been another issue raised, I think, by Paul, uh, that about the convergence. That's another area where mm -hmm. we do far too little work. Well, one could do a set of experiments at different resolutions and trying to find out what is uh, the, 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 the role of resolution. It appears to me that uh, the, from, from my own experience, it appears to me that kind of kilometer resolution, one to three kilometer, maybe four, as Andreas is here, I should say, to four kilometers, that that, uh, that somewhere in this area, it's something like a sweet spot. I mean, not much happens if you if you are at higher resolution. The improvements are not so significant as if you reach this kind of four kilometers or so. But we don't really know what happens if we go to even higher resolution. Maybe things continue to change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe that these were suggestions for future studies uh, that uh, one could also. Andreas said one could do, that the U.S. scientists should, should collaborate more closely. I think this would be a potential really to have a collaboration mm -hmm. across continents. Yeah. 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 Very well said. But um, before I call on Kristen, I know your your hands has been up for a while. I just want to follow up on uh, uh, Chris discussion a little bit. So, so we have heard a bit about resolution, but I'm a little surprised not to hear much about physics in terms of the type of uncertainty that might be introduced. I, I just wonder if any of you might have a comment about that, because we know, for example, cloud microphysics could be really important in simulating convective storms. Um, so, 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 yeah. Anytime, if anyone has has something to to chime in on that, so so that's also kind of related to my question about how to build the the ensemble. Yeah. All right. So I'll I'll go to Kristen. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I had some similar comments to both Christoph and you know, just thinking about that super scaling perspective. Just one addition: we did separate our flash flood cases by intensity of the system, so basically by strength of vertical motion. And we did see that the scaling increased as we went to stronger and stronger vertical motion systems. So I think the role of local storm dynamics in these systems is actually really critical, particularly in these PGW simulations where we're actually doing a good job of representing thermodynamic changes in climate, but not getting storm track shifts and large scale climate dynamic shifts. So just a comment there. Um, actually, on Ruby, on your comment about parameterizations, there's been some really mm -hmm. heavy testing of these, you know, long 13 and 20 and 40 year simulations to make sure these parameterizations and the coupling uh, kind of interact well. There are some challenges there. We've seen some local challenges with, you know, tropical versus subtropical and mid-latitude uh, behaviors with these parameterizations. So I think that's a really important and ongoing uh, discussion, but it's a really important thing to bring up and discuss. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are there any other? Okay, Paul? Yeah, just very briefly on that point, I think that there's an opportunity here to use large eddy simulations combined with machine learning models in order to try to bypass the physics parameterizations and see if we can perhaps validate those parameterizations using the, the machine learning approaches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Mike, back to Michael. Uh, Michael, you are muted. Yeah. Sorry. Paul, you said the magic words about machine learning. Um, 
and I'd like to make a comment about that. Um, some of you may be aware of this new NVIDIA code called uh, Forecast Net, which is a, a trained uh, version of ERA-5. And there is a lot of noise about making some hyper large ensembles, you know, 10,000 member ensembles with this thing because it could be done. And I think the, there's a lot of unknown questions here. You know, will, you know, typically when you train something, um, uh, you, 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 you can interpolate a lot, but you're not train, you're not going to extrapolate outside of the training space in general. Um, and so there are 44 years of ERA-5, you'd expect that on average, the biggest precipitation would be a 44 year return value. Um, but they don't train on precipitation. They, pr they train on winds and, um, and geopotential height and temperature and humidity comes into play through the initial conditions. And so it's actually really unclear to me whether or not we could populate this distribution so we could really get you know, black swan events. Um, or will the dynamics that the large scale dynamics that it's trained on be the limiting factor and that it will just be 10,000 instances of large scale meteorological patterns that we've already seen? I don't think we know the answer to that, but it is an exciting uh, new area um, that, 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 that bears, um, bear, bears investigation. Yeah, so yeah, thank you, Michael. I think this is a very important point to bring up about machine learning, because uh, there are more and more users of uh, machine learning. And I think some some might felt that the type of estimate that we are talking a lot about, like PMP estimate, a, a lot is riding on it because some people might be making <laughs> decision based on that. And so the trustworthiness of uh, machine learning is really uh, a, an important question, right? So, I think these are also um, things that we need to consider. So I think I saw Paul's hand up. Uh, 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 no, it's actually Kristen's first before Paul. Okay. I am actually changing the topic. So Paul, if you had something on that topic, go for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just wanted to comment very briefly on um, Super Klaus's Clapeyron as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to admit that I don't have like a full understanding of the complete literature on Super Klaus's Clapeyron, but I think in many instances you get Super Klaus's Clapeyron behavior because you sh sharpen your individual precipitation systems. Or in the case mm -hmm. of Patrick Wola and Wainer, your tropical cyclones basically contract, and as a con and that's related to the fact that basically you have more up upward motion and basically the eye wall of the storm. So I think further studies on specific storm types in order to assess um, under what conditions do you get more sharpening of the system? And I know Ruby, of course, you did that work with uh, Xiaodong Chen as well on sharpening of atmospheric rivers. I think it'd be very interesting to see based on the scale of the system to what degree we can anticipate sharpening in the future in response to increases in mm -hmm. like land surface warming or the vertical profile of temperature. Mm -hmm. I would Great. add, I'd Thank love you. to see that with MCS. Andy. <laughs> yes, there are data sets also to, that allow us to, to do this investigation now. Yep, great. Thank you, Paul. And then so next is Kristen and then next is Andrea. So yeah, I wanted to go back to your questions, Ruby, uh, particularly number one, the low and the high resolution models. And so one of the things that we've been seeing is that um, although the, you know, the global climate models are not representing some of these things like MCSs and things like that, what they do well is they actually do get the thermodynamic changes. So things like convective available potential energy, convective inhibition, things like sheet, you know, they're actually getting some of those convective environments that we know are important in driving the distribution of storm modes across the globe. And so, uh, you know, linking in, in kind of the thermodynamic space and some of these convective environments, I think is one way to bridge that gap. I also do think a broader conversation, going back to some of Christoph's comments, bringing the weather and climate community together and in particular coordinating our efforts kind of, you know, to, to do these types of simulations and thinking about what types of ensembles we wanted to do that may be driven by climate models or driven by other types of forcing data sets. This is a, I think, a, a, a really big opportunity that we should actually really start to self-organize on. So yeah, just some comments linking those and going back to number one, mm -hmm. I put down uh, and also number <laughs> three there. Thank you very much, Kristen. Uh -huh. And so next is Andreas and then next is uh, Dan. Yeah, so I just wanted to comment on Michael's comment. We, we see this actually in our simulations that the MCS is like the heavy rainfall area is more concentrated in, in the center, which is really concerning if you think about flash flooding specifically. But I also want to mention, like Kristen brought this up in her talk, 
translation speed is extremely important as well. Like anything that happens with translation speed, if the storms would slow down under future conditions, and we have some examples of some papers that suggest that that would be had would have a big impact on on P and P. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, indeed, important question, right? Because if we are looking at a local location and the storm moves slowly, then it would dump a lot more precipitation. And, and th so, so Andres, in that sense, do you feel that we have some theoretical understanding about why uh, the translation speed might be changing? So uh, this is like in our simulations, the translation speed, at least of MCSs, didn't change significantly. Mm -hmm. I know that like, there's some literature on tropical cyclones that seems mm -hmm. to prefer to stall, especially when they make landfall. Right. We know that like, the, the shear environment is changing in the central US in the, in, the, in the future. It should be less shear, which could have impacts on the translation speed and potentially slows things down, but they can also have impacts on the organization of storms. So these dynamical changes are really important as well. Like I think we have a much better handle on, on the, on the thermodynamic changes than we have on the dynamical changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just add too, we've looked at yeah. South America, right? The subtropical South America hotspot and the, the zero to six kilometer shear there in the large ensemble actually increases in contrast to the US. Mm -hmm. So these things vary globally and, and also are very right. these duration and intensity frameworks. Yes, so we have more challenges. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, so next is Stan and then Michael. Ruby, my question really takes uh, a things in a different direction. And so I don't want to cut this discussion off prematurely. So so Mike, uh, Michael, are you responding to some of the earlier yeah, comments? Um, <laughs> I had a short comment about storm translation speeds. Um, Jim Cosson has demonstrated in observations that tropical cyclones over the United States, once after they make landfall, have slowed down. And there's weak to moderate evidence supported in the 25 kilometer scale models that this is happening um, not at every latitude but unfortunately at the mid latitudes of where we live um, probably not so much in the tropics but i don't think there's actually any any reason to um, suggest that the kinds of stalls like we saw in hurricane harvey are are more or less likely um, only because we just don't have enough data to say they're just there are only two stalled storms in the whole Atlantic hurricane record and um, and it doesn't seem to happen very often in simulations either. Mm -hmm. So I see also hands up from Paul and Kevin are you, are you both also commenting on the translation speed? Uh, or, yeah or, I, okay. I just want to right. comment very, very briefly mm -hmm. that uh, the translation speed is one of those areas where the PGW simulations don't really help a whole lot. Um, mm -hmm. So that's where we definitely need to rely upon potentially a high resolution ensemble. Um, but as Michael alluded to, it happens so rarely that you're going to need so many years of simulations in order to do it. So it's going to be an outstanding question for a while, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Indeed. And Kevin, are you also commenting well, on? Well, I was just, I was actually going to say exactly what. Paul just said mm -hmm. that that's one of the downsides of the kind of storyline approach. But I, I was going to also add to the discussion around really quick the the Clausius Clapron and, and and there has been work that has suggested right um, and actually some of it is by one of Kristen's uh, postdocs right now, a former PhD student in my group, which which there are different ways in which different scientists are trying to break down ch changes both from the thermodynamic component. Um, from warming in things like tropical cyclones, as well as trying to look at changes in intensity or changes in spatial scale of the storm. And so um, there has been efforts to start to quantify if you do see a super Clausius Clapeyron change in some set of simulations or over some set of data set to try to quantify what percentage of that is coming from a thermodynamic change in the SST, mm -hmm. what, what percentage of that is coming from, you know, the change in intensity that you see if you hold everything else constant. And, and so there is some work to suggest that when we do see the these kind of super Clausius Clapeyron changes, particularly in travel cyclones, that it is coming in part because there's this additive effect of a change in the, the circulation. But that is mm -hmm. mostly true in I'll just mention, right, in model simulations of the tropical cyclones, and I think there's less evidence 
for it thus far when we've tried to look at it in the dynamical sense, or sorry, in the in the dynamical sense in, in observations, in part because I think as Michael alluded to earlier, I mean, you don't have full representations of the full 3D circulation for an observed storm. You, you just have these, you know, opportunities when a I'm talking about hurricanes now, but when you when you have the, the hurricane hunters that go through at specific levels and you have snapshots of what it looks like. But mm -hmm. hey, uh, Kevin, I, I would like to follow up on your comment that when you see super clausius clepharon in tropical cyclone, you said it's more related to circulation. I think there are two aspects of circulation. One is really changes in the larger scale circulation that might have changed the tracks of the TC and things like that. The other part of the circulation is actually the vertical velocity, which itself is actually driven by thermodynamics, right? So, so which part are you talking so about? So when, when uh, Alyssa Stansfield has done this work, she's focused on um, actually using the, a dynamical measure of intensity of a storm. So whether that's mm -hmm. like as averaged horizontal winds, um, mm -hmm. and, but, but looking at, you know, under the same, when you have storms that are, you know, at the same SSTs, but in different climates or whatever, um, you know, can you start to capture how much of the change in rainfall is due to the fact that the storms are actually stronger so this mm -hmm, linked to the mm -hmm. vertical. So it's more of the getting to more your question. More of the thermodynamic the yes. Yeah. So it's okay. convergence, and then you have your your vertical updrafts. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. I think we should get to Dan now. <laughs> Dan. Yeah. Um, so as I said, this is taking it in a very different direction. Um, last week we were dealing with stakeholders. These were people who had to tell uh, dam dam owners how how big to build their dams and. I think they would look at this discussion as, as largely academic. And we heard some pushback last week to using climate models at all. Um, there, was, there were comments of the, the uncertainties were too, 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 too large to be useful. There were different projections. There were differences between the models. Um, and I think that uh, they would probably say, if we, if we need to integrate climate change into PMP, Keep it very simple. Keep it, use Clausius Clapeyron or use the uh, scaling factor that that Christoph talked about. Something something very simple. Um, so I'd love to hear some pushback from the climate modelers themselves of what value does using the models bring that a, a simple approach couldn't use uh, or couldn't couldn't. Uh, what value do do the models bring? Mm -hmm. Very good question. So first of all, I want to just mention, so Jim, I, I know that you have a different question, but, but since we are also kind of branching out on different questions, I, I would come back to, to you <laughs> so that you have your, your chance to ask your question. But so Michael, are you responding to Dan's uh, question? Yes, and okay. I would agree, we can't use models alone. We need to use our brains. And, and what I mean by that is we have to understand what's going on. We have to have we have to have not only model results, but even more importantly, we have to have good theoretical foundations about what's going on. You know, Kevin just mentioned some of these things, you know, changes in, in vertical motion, you know, causing us as a mechanism for superclasses clavron or changes in translation speed or whatever it happens to be. And it's obviously gonna vary from storm types. And we'll get some of that information from models, but most of it we're gonna get from each other and, 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 and hashing this out. So it's, it's, it's not the models, it's the modelers and the, and the scientists. And I think that's my, that would be my pushback to, to this community, that, that particular community is, you know, we don't believe the models any more than you do, you know, but we use them as, one um, set of tools. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, uh, Paul. Um, I I fully agree with the, this um, stakeholder statement, honestly, uh, and I think that um, Christoph was very correct in saying that when it comes down to actually using the data, having a multiplicative factor is going to be the most easily communicated means of allowing folks to adjust to the future. And I think that the use of models is to allow us to actually have confidence in whatever multiplicative factor we actually come up with. Like when we say that 1.4 and we say it's derived from Clausius Clapeyron, do we have a response when somebody comes along and says, well, how are you so confident that the 
ch change in precipitation will be constrained by clausius clavron And so we can use the models to explore the space of possibilities and see if there are instances where that 1.4 factor may not hold. Uh, and that deeper understanding of the, the underlying processes will then give us greater confidence in its employ in uh, impacts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Andrea? Yeah, I also fully agree with the statements. I think we really need multiple lines of evidence, like whatever tool, and this could be machine learning, statistical, statistical methods, observations, and often those tools have um, different strengths and weaknesses. So really using all of the information that we have um, is, is essential. And I, I also want to defend the models a little bit a little <laughs> bit here, because I think it depends which type of model you're talking about. If, if stakeholders only work with CMIP type models, I fully agree. Like, but this this high resolution models are different type of models. If they believe in weather forecasts, like if they get a warning, take care. Like in, in a week, your dam might spill over because the high resolution model puts a lot of rainfall there. They should also believe in this kind of of modeling that we are using because it's the same type of model. Um, so it really depends here as well. And and one more thing, I think your task not only for changing the future, but also looking at current climate estimates, isn't it? So I think modeling has a has a role to play here as well. So taking into account in the current climate, what PMP is, in addition, like Paul made this comment as well, like observations have large uncertainties and there are really big regions in the US that are very badly observed. Um, and modeling can definitely help to fill these gaps. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Kristen and then uh, Christoph. Yeah, I'll keep mine short. I was about to say almost the exact same thing that Andreas just mentioned, but I will say that it matters what stakeholders we're talking about. If you're trying to build one dam in one particular area, maybe it's complex terrain, right? The way that you would look at a GCM versus a convection permitting model estimation of the future is quite different than if you're trying to engineer like the, you know, the, the levee system in the Mississippi River Basin, right? These, these things are 30 years out of date. We need to think about these broader scale things. So I think that what the stakeholders are looking for and what the strengths and weaknesses across these tools, across skills, I think all of this should be considered. And I also think we need to do a better job of communicating our uncertainties in these different modeling frameworks as well uh, to better bridge with those stakeholders. Very well said, thank you. Uh, well, Christoph? Can I, can I give uh, comment yeah. on that? I can, uh, I... Not, just, not just convey our uncertainties, but also convey our confidence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, yeah. Uh, Chris? Yes, uh, I, I think um, I, I wanted to say something about combining models and scaling. And I think that's something we have to look into. There is some evidence in Europe, for instance, where we have the Mediterranean amplification and dramatic reduction in precipitation frequency forecasted by the GCMs and RCM at, a, at any resolution in the cool of the Mediterranean during summer in particular. And so it might be there, there might be ways maybe to combine changes in frequency, taking these the kind of information from the models, which will, will depend also on changes in circulation, which will not be included in the scaling, and and changes in scaling, which can when which can really base uh, be based on a physical argument, based uh, on the thermodynamic processes. So there might be ways uh, th that should be explored whether one can combine these kind of okay. different pieces of information. Great, thank you very much. So now let's go to Jim. <laughs> Sorry, Jim, you, you have been holding for a while. Yeah. Uh, well, um, my question um, kind of ties back to the long history of probable maximum precipitation and its heritage uh, was a, a quantity that meteorologists would develop first principle assessments of maximum precipitation. And my overly broad question is whether there are ways of, uh, of thinking about that problem, thinking about uh, bounds, physical bounds. Um, and I think it would, it would serve a variety of roles, but one would be providing um, a physical process context for studies. So any thoughts on, uh, on studies that uh, directly address um, upper limits to precipitation. 1,800 millimeters per hour in one minute, how do you do that? And can you do more? Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Any any response? <laughs> A very tough question. <laughs> yeah, um, I've always been enamored with this study by Martinez uh, Villalobos and Neelan from a couple of years back, which is entitled Why Do Precipitation Intensities Fall, uh, Tend to Follow Gamma Distributions, where they use a very simple physically driven model, physically justified model in order to derive probability distributions associated with precipitation intensities. And I think that line of thinking could be taken further in order to um, in order to get better statistical distributions of precipitation intensities. Uh, and basically what they find in that analysis, at least for somewhat longer term precipitation events on the order of a day or so, is that you have a regime where you have a gamma distributed precipitation distribution, and then you have a region, a fall off region. Um, and so I think one of the difficulties in the statistical analysis of the precipitation distributions is getting the point at which that fall off region really begins. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, Michael? Uh, I'm going to defer to Kristen. Okay, uh, Kristen. Uh -huh. Yeah, so just a couple of comments. It's a really good question. Um, and in thinking about kind of the Doswell uh, ingredients based framework for flash flood forecasting, which is intensity and duration, pieces of that equation include things like precipitation efficiency and vertical moisture flux. And so things, you know, thinking about how those particular parameters, uh, you know, may shift in a future climate, thinking about you know, what is the actual maximum amount of rain that we can get out of the atmosphere? Some theoretical kind of studies on that may help some of that. I know there has been some work looking at precipitation efficiency. I think we need to do more on that. Uh, but I, I think it's a really hard question. I think we should all think about how to answer that question with the tools that we have available to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm also curious whether the answer to this could also depend on the storm types that, that, that we have been Mm -hmm. discussing all along. Uh -huh. Agreed. Yeah. And if you're in the tropics or the subtropics or the mid latitudes, you know, these things would, would, you know, these things would change. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Any other comments? I think this is indeed a very important question, right? So, so, so the maximum, the absolute maximum in the present day, as well as in the future. Uh, Michael. Yeah. I, I wanted to wait until I heard what Chris had to say, but I, it, it is an important question. And and I think, Jimmy, you, you raise it, you, you pose it in a different way than we've been talking about it, you know, about instead of looking at precipitation, look at the drivers, you know, like, you know, that were, that, that originally went into these calculations a long time ago. And, and, you know, perhaps these kilometer scale models have the fidelity to tell us something about that. And that might be a more tractable question um, you know, if, by framing it based in the old way and looking at the inputs to that calculation and say, how do we think those are changing? You know, we certainly know the moisture is going up by Clausius Clavron, but how are these other factors changing? And and that would be an interesting thing to do. Um, and we probably have enough model output from uh, Christoph's calculations and Andreas's calculation to to make some headway. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, back to Kristen. Yeah, I'll just make one quick comment too that you know I, I show a table in my meteorology class on you know the historic rainfalls right the the rainfall records uh, of the of the global um, you know distribution and a lot of the rainfall records come from Cherrapunji, India in like the 1800s. So the question is going back to how well do we trust those observations right? We saw some really great information today about challenges in observational networks even today. So you know some so this brings back to the question you know how how trustworthy are some of those 1800 you know, uh, metrics uh, of rainfall records, that's something also to consider in this in this question. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, Obi? Uh, yeah, let me, let me explain my, my issue, I think. Uh, I think Michael mentioned, you know, number of models that are needed to do the estimation statistically and, you know, the upper bound. And we know the shape parameter is very poorly estimated in some methods. And you showed you had to have uh, a very large number of models. Uh, now, given that I think from Chris, we heard that you know observation-based estimations don't go to very rare extremes uh, because we don't have enough data. So my question is, are these you know two questions? Is there any other alternative but to use a combination of data and models? And the other question is, do these models, the high-resolution models, have the right of right type of physics to sort of um, 
so they can be driven to generate PMP like, you know, um, estimate. I think it's Ruby's question, like, do we have the right physics in there? And that may be my lack of knowledge on the model, so. Mm -hmm. Great. So, 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 Obi, I think you're asking two questions. Number one is, how can we combine data with model to, to oh. better take advantage of both? Is oh, that... is there any other? Is that, isn't that the yeah. only way? Right. Because mm -hmm. given the non-stationarity and climate change right. implications, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, and, and that goes back to also tie a little bit to, to one of the questions that I gave uh, the panelists is how can we take advantage of both models and statistics to help right. us maybe get at that right. upper bound or constraint, right? And then your right. second question is related to the physics, yeah. So I would like to see if anyone, okay, so I think Paul's hand was up first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanna address that question about the physics. If I was to rephrase that, I would ask, are there any vertical distributions of relevant meteorological fields like aerosols and water vapor content and cloud water that give rise to anomalous precipitation regimes? Uh, and so an anomalous precipitation regime here is one which is like far outside the norm of what we would expect from precipitation. Uh, and so in order to make an argument that the physical parameterizations don't capture PMP type events, we would have to make the argument that PMP naturally emerges from an anomalous precipitation regime. And so I'm not sure what the literature necessarily says on that subject, but I would suspect that you could we, we could make an argument that the parameterizations probably capture the, the, the relevant physics correctly. Mm -hmm. Others All can right. argue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Andreas? Yeah, I wanted to comment on exactly on this as well. Like if we look at our simulations, or also the weather forecasting simulations that we run at NCAR, like this very, like we had a range of very intense rainfall events over the last couple of years, like in the order of 500 to 1,000 year return values. And those are very, fairly well simulated often. Like it depends on the large scale situation, how predictable those are. But Harvey, for example, the West Virginia flood that I showed you, the Kentucky flood, um, Tennessee that we had last year or two years ago like this were all pretty well captured and like especially if you look at the ensemble the mean of the ensemble intensity was pretty close to the observations which gives me quite some confidence so but I think also what Christoph showed like we, we really have to look at how if we really are interested in the in the physics, we have to look at fairly short rainfall records, like 15 minutes or really e maybe even higher resolution. This, this gets challenging with observations as well, because if you look at daily accumulations, you can get various ways to get to high accumulations yeah. by raining over a long time a little bit or having a really big system that drops. Like So I think if you're really curious about physics, we have to really look really closely at the process level. And I think there are some compensating errors that we have in the models, which work in our favor. But I think overall, they do really good. All right. Thank you. Any other comments related to um, both Obi's uh, question, as well as if we want to go back to some of the previous questions, like from Jim and some of the earlier ones? Or particularly, I don't think we have heard too much about combining data or statistics with model yet. Michael, yeah. I wasn't going to comment on, on that specifically, but rather on right. something that Christoph mm -hmm. said about um, inner comparison of different models. Mm. Um, I think this is something that we really should do. And, you know, we have, we, we know how to do inner comparison. Um, we should, should think about what are some interesting experiments, you know, either short-term forecasting, which means we could do it relatively easily, or or else or otherwise i think that's an excellent idea and and mm -hmm. you know use the e3sm the screen the 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 icon morph whatever have you and 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 not just one but maybe multiple um uh uh inter, you know, multiple situations to intercompare mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it, so this can be in the context of model in the comparison as well as in the context of generating ensemble Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, the more things we do, the more we learn. I mean, that's mm -hmm. really obvious. Great. So it's I think fun. the next, yeah, the next hand up is Andreas and then Paul. Yeah, fully, I fully agree with this point. And I think like even idealized simulations, like 
if we can break down everything to get to the core, could be very interesting to run with this different modeling system as long as we can do this. I think one really important point, and Christoph brought this up as well, like we really have to make sure to use the same statistics to look at the, the quantities mm -hmm. you're interested in. But right. Like, if you look at the literature, you can almost get anything you like by using like dry days, wet days, mm -hmm. you know, use some local dew point or higher level temperature. Like we really have to work together to make these studies comparable because otherwise like it's it's confusing even for us that work in this field but i can't <laughs> imagine how, how confusing it must be for like stakeholders that want to use the data yeah and sometimes these details are even lost when, when people read the paper or, or they, maybe not, not even, even reported them. yeah yeah mm -hmm. good point uh paul yeah i was just gonna say as part of the hyperfastness project we have a big a component of the project being the development of test beds, uh, which are effectively individual events where we simulate it with us with several models and try to combine uh, try to compile a consistent set of observations that folks can then use to evaluate their own modeling systems. And so we have a recent paper out on the 2012 North American Duresho that you kind of saw as one, one of the slides in my presentation. But the idea is to expand that to six or seven different historical events of different types uh, and have that, that data set of consistent observations available to the broader community in case they want to run essentially the same simulation and same uh, evaluation. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Any other uh, comments or we could even ask new, new questions. Yeah, if, if anyone has new questions to ask between the panelists or, yeah. Ruby, I, I guess one, to, of, one of the yeah. questions you posed that we haven't talked about is that black swan, right? What about yes, uh -huh. events that, you know, we don't currently see in the current climate, but may happen in the future climate, just bringing mm -hmm. that up in my yes, list. Uh -huh. Right. Yes. Uh -huh. I, mean, I think it's a particularly hard problem. You know, the pseudo global warming <laughs> approach, for example, right? We take exactly. existing events and apply thermodynamic shifts, right, to see how those change. But when you think about a climate model, right, you know, while the thermodynamic environments are re well represented and we have storm shifts and storm tracks, how to identify those those black swan events that then we would downscale? I think that's a really tough problem, but it's a really interesting one in representing potential extreme precipitation that we don't mm -hmm. see the spectrum of modes that we see in the current climate so right yeah so this is also partly related to an, an earlier question that i asked andre is it? it's like if we select a set of storms to do the storyline type of simulations i mean how do we know that those are the storms that will produce the maximum amount of precipitation in the future potentially that even the storm types could change right the, the types that produce the, the maximum amount now may not be the same storm type in that location that would produce the maximum amount yeah. uh michael it, 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 i found it amusing you raised that because i talked about that today in the other lecture i gave oh <laughs> um, uh, we had a project at, at berkeley lab led by Prabhat for um using machine learning um pattern recognition uh, technologies. I, I call it the Facebook app, where we can identify storms um, um, by training. Um, so a supervised machine learning uh, technique. What we never got to though, was the unsupervised machine learning pattern detection. And, and that might be the way to find these things. You know, let's say you have, you know, multiple decades of, um, of high of kilometer scale or two kilometer scale simulations. That's a, a lot of data. You, you're not going to be able to watch movies to find these things. It, it, I've tried that. Um, you know, so having some, you know, exploiting these pattern recognition algorithms in some unsupervised way could find the things that we don't, you know, the unknown unknowns, as it were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that a lot, Michael. And you know, some of the flash flood history that I showed in my talk comes from the, you know, the big challenge of predicting heavy rainfall. It's really hard. And there's so many different storm modes and synoptic modes that produce mm -hmm. flash flood rainfall. I see Russ on Russ Schumacher on the call here. His group has done some really exciting work with kind of short-term heavy rainfall predictability using machine learning. Um, and I think that you know, applying some of these techniques to these longer time scales may help us identify some of these situations that fall outside of what we currently observe. And so I think there's a lot of merit to, to what you just mentioned, Michael, and 
it comes into the context of you know how forecasters actually have built these pattern recognition types of frameworks because of the challenges of heavy rainfall uh, across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Any any other comments related to a similar topic on black swan? Or going back, or going back to the one about statist combining statistics and and modeling. I think these are the two questions that perhaps we um, could hear a little bit if there are more suggestions of how we move forward. That's a really hard. Uh, Paul, question. okay, uh, really Paul. Hard. Yeah, see, so Paul has an answer. <laughs> well, I mean, we just need a meta analysis, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> Basically. You have statistics and models are two different ways of trying to tackle the same problem. And so we just do the sure what it all thing and collect all the evidence and see if it allows us to constrain the uncertainty bounds. Mm -hmm. the, okay. the, yeah. the, the issue is that, you know, if you were just calculate return value on 50 years of data with all the covariance you have, when you go to say the thousand year return value, the uncertainty bounds are pretty large. Um, the um, I actually, I didn't mention this. In the pictures I showed, there were two sets of error bars, and the, the wide set was just an empirical estimate of, of the, um, the return values, and the, the, the narrow or blue bars were that from the extreme value analysis. And so extreme value theory, if, if nothing else, it, it didn't really change the, the, the mean estimate of the return value, but it tightened the error bounds on it. And so... You know that part's good, um, but you know, you know, in the in the U.S. we do have some. We have quite a bit of data that that is over a hundred years. That is, that 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 would pass most quality control. Um, as Kristen says, in the nineteenth century, you know, it, it's a little wonky, <laughs> um, um, but not everywhere. I mean, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. there may be some places where we can do this. Great, thank you, uh, Andres. Yeah, uh, like uh, what came to me was really to to try to trade space for time. Like we do this with the, st the stochastic storm transposition. Mm -hmm. Like the the PMP field, depending on where you are. If you're in the mountains, it's, it's way more complex. But if you're more in flat terrain, it should be fairly smooth, I would say. So you could try to to get better estimates by really doing the statistical transpositions in, in a smart way. And I know that there are people out there that do that. And I saw some fairly encouraging work on that. Yeah. In, yeah, indeed, you. Andreas, um, um, my, my esteemed colleague, Mark Risser, has um, some new papers on that over the United States um, where we, we, we use multiple covariates, um, uh, uh, seven different ones, including modes of natural variability, as well as uh, greenhouse gases and aerosols um, and spatial statistics. Um, uh, there's a concept called um, uh, tail dependence that um, we've also been exploiting that um, our other colleague, Lee Kung Zhang, um, I can send you some of those papers if you're interested. Mm -hmm. It is powerful right. and 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 um, it, 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 we haven't looked at it at the really extreme. We're looking at more in a detection and attribution sense, but that that actually is something I'll I'll bring up with Mark next week when I see him. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other comments or or new questions? Okay. I'll just wait one minute <laughs> to see if they, yeah if they are new questions that, that we haven't uh, answered. I, I would have expected some questions from Dan uh, Cooley or Christopher <laughs> about statistical um, uh -huh. aspects. Uh, Andreas? This is more a question for you. What are the next steps that you're taking now? Like, how do you incorporate this information into what we're doing? Yeah, yeah, indeed. In my closing, I will okay, very sorry. briefly talk about that. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh -huh. All right, any other questions? Okay, so with that, I really want to thank everyone, the speakers, the panelists, for really lively 
discussion. I, I learned a lot and there's so much, so many new points and so many new insights that, that we have heard. I think this is really wonderful. And for, for all the time preparing uh, the presentations, definitely those are really high quality and very um, useful presentations. So, so with that, I, I want to thank um, everyone again. I also thank, want to thank the committee member for joining and participating in questions and, 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 and a lot of uh, great discussion. Um, so, um, First of all, I'd like to say that there, there is a recording of uh, this session, which um, anyone can go back to uh, to, uh, to, to view. And, and in fact, even the previous two information gathering session, you can you can go to our um, committee um, website and, and review those. Um, and then also the event website has a link um, to a form where you can contribute perspectives as well as insights on the sessions guiding questions. We really welcome uh, those who will, um, perhaps haven't participated, but uh, but uh, would, would be able to um, provide uh, some comments and perspective. And if you visit the project website, you can also find the links to the event pages for past events, including recordings of those events, et cetera. So what we would be doing next for the committee would be to review all of these information that we have gathered from the uh, get, uh, information gathering sessions, three of them, and then we would um, have uh, more meetings convening um, among the committee member to review what we have learned, and ultimately um, we would be producing a report uh, ba based on that, uh, based on all of this information as well as uh, deliberation by the committee. Um, I want to maybe also call on Jim to see if Jim has any um, perhaps a a comment or two related to the next steps uh, since Andreas asked about that. Um, Ruby, just one comment. Um, mm -hmm. the, the committee is tasked with addressing these uh, four specific tasks, um, not to address other issues, um, mm -hmm. uh, and, but to fully address uh, each of the issues and provide recommendations uh, to Noah. And, and that's what we plan on doing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yep. And you all have been helping us a lot. <laughs> I think we have heard a lot of important points that that and and also new insights that are that are very useful. So with that, I think we would be ending. Um, thank you very much all for joining in, uh, especially also for Christoph and Michael who are joining <laughs> from Europe. Um, and it's very late over there. Um, thank you all again and have a good day. Bye.